Professor uh, Ayan uh, Christik and uh, expert panel from UTM, which is our uh, Associate Professor Dr. Cairo Anwar and uh, Dr. Aiman Rashid and lastly, Dr. Muhammad Faiza Rani. Okay, uh, without further ado, let's uh, uh, hear from uh, our uh, first presenter from, uh, is it okay we start, we begin with Bruno University? Okay. Yes. Okay, we will start with our first presenter, which is uh, Mr. Beklav uh, Sana. The uh, research title on Material History, uh, Planetary Urbanizations uh, by the World Ocean. So, uh, virtual floor is yours. Are you ready? Is there Václav Shana or not? Radku. Not sure. I think uh, I will I will text him and I will but uh, but he communicated about this uh, session with me yesterday evening. So I hope uh, he should yeah, if uh, if he's not here, he has some technical issues or something like this. Yeah. So can, can anyone else step in? Maybe Maria or uh, Katka. I think Maria or Katka can can go first, and I will I will text uh, to Václav. Okay. Ask Maria, please. I need a minute. Mm. No problem. I can start. So please. Yeah, I'm trying to let the presentation go. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, it's my time uh, to talk about uh, the topic of mine. It's the interpretation of temporary structures uh, in the context of activation of abandoned sites. Um, I have a brief, sorry. Yeah, I have a brief content of my today's presentation. Uh, I would like to um, describe the temporary activation. Um, then I moved uh, in my research to case studies of successful projects in Europe. Uh, uh, I follow with the creation of the database, which maps successful projects of activation of abandoned sites. And uh, it's, um, it's publicly uh, accessible and uh, uploaded on a regular time. Then uh, I deal with the topic of the uh, role of mediator between the providers of the properties and providers of temporary activities. And uh, the actual thing I'm researching or working on at the moment is the creation of a menu which would uh, include the cooperation with the cities and the municipalities and the properties which are vacant at the moment. So firstly, the temporary uh, use, it focuses on a single purpose uh, at a specific urban space at a limited time duration. Um, there are some principles, I would just go shortly through it. So they really uh, count on instant experience. They concentrate its activities on a vacant and backward place. They also are very flexible. They you, uh, have minimal requirements on the place and they use modular constructions, also some mobile things, and they work with the recycling materials. So their aim is really to activate the place and to bring the finances there and to, um, to promote the whole reconstruction of the place. Uh, when we are talking about the vacancy, uh, some socialist, sociologists, uh, they describe it as a liquid period because the property is still looking for some uh, permanent use. Uh, for example, German uh, specialist called Urban Catalyst, they describe it as a free uh, crop rotation system because after a really a uh, huge intense uh, functioning of a building, there is a free period when the property is waiting for its future permanent use. So we have, we have a resource uh, to work with. 
and sometimes the temporary activity is called pop up. Uh, it means that it really want, wants to focus and to bring attention to the vacant space and they want to promote the place and to uh, to start the conversation and to start the work to make uh, to bring more permanent function there. And uh, in my research, I uh, started with analyzing of case studies of successful projects to learn how they function, how they are able to make the make the functioning of the building more permanent. And these case studies I uh, collected into a database, which is called Archipop, and it collects successful projects of the, these temporary activations in Europe. Uh, the users of the database can be variable, it can be the interested public, potential investors. Also, uh, I want to stress the potential of the place for the owners of these complexes themselves. And also there are huge numbers of these vacant places, again, uh, between the uh, properties of the municipalities. And the database is regularly updated. Uh, we work with individual cards of the project, and there is also an interactive map where you can find uh, these projects. And I would like to show it to you because it's also in English version. Uh, so please be patient. I will yeah, it's here. Uh, can you see? Can you see the website itself, please? You have stopped, stopped sharing at the moment. Uh -huh, okay. I'll try again. Okay, so now you can see there is also the English uh, translation available. And the database is really uh, well, just briefly divided into four parts. There is a brief introduction to what is the pop-up and how the Archipop works. We have there the projects, uh, which are, can be filtered by the country origin. And uh, you can also uh, find if it's a uh, cultural heritage and what was the original function of the property. Uh, each project is presented on a single card. Yes, where you can uh, get to know more information when you go to the links which are available there. And there is a yeah, deep description of the project and you can move between between the project themselves and get to know what you are interested in. Also, uh, there is the part with the map below. Yeah, and as I mentioned, these are a selected project in the region of Europe because it's close to the context of the Czech Republic and you can decide which projects you are interested in and move them move to the card of the project and the current topic I'm working on is the menu which I mentioned I would like to uh, promote it with the cooperation with the mun municipality uh, for me in, uh, in very important part is the account on social media because we are this account, I am able to communicate with the with the authors of the project, and it's very very useful when I want to ask them for more information, and I want to update the information I found on the website themselves. So uh, I regularly uh, go there to filter and to search for more projects and for the communication with uh, the companies or. Uh, the authors, architects, or urbanists themselves. So this is about the uh, database and the social media. Uh, now, I would move back to, to the presentation itself. Okay, uh, so I talked about the database about the social media and now the current uh, research is the role of the mediator 
which is the middle person between the provider of the temporary function and the provider of uh, the property, which is vacant. Uh, I came to uh, an interesting uh, point that uh, many big cities in Europe, they have their own agencies. It's also in the Czech Republic, it's called Refilova. You have incredible in Bologna, many in Brussels, Paris, there is Free Riga, Hupolis in Berlin and many, many others. So I try to uh, search for the main, main principles of the functioning so I could generalize them into the steps uh, and into the kind of menu for the municipalities. So there are some, some of the roles uh, which are the most important for the uh, role for the person of mediator. Uh, so they promote the principles of the temporary use. It's a multidisciplinary team. So there are uh, professionals from the urban and architecture field, but also from the point of economy and sociologists. And so there, are, there is also there is a huge discussion among uh, many fields. Uh, they work on uh, legal principles and they create a draft of uh, legal documents. Uh, they, the, I think the most important part when they are really dealing the vacant spaces is the database of vacant spaces. And I came also to a point that they, they provide a reservation system where you can easily choose a property or choose the building and you can uh, make a reservation for just one day to use it. And, uh, and also there is the cooperation with the city and for the, with the urban planning discourse and so on. Uh, so the, my aim at the moment is to uh, create the menu and I'm starting to uh, the cooperation with a particular municipality and the vacant property which is in their ownership. And with, together with them, I would like to set up the principles of the temporary activities in these uh, kind of properties. And my final result from this uh, period would, would be uh, to, to make a pop-up event, which would uh, really show and prove the principles I created and to prove that the vacant properties uh, have their potential and they really uh, uh, can use the temporary activity to activate them for more permanent function. So thank you for your attention. So thank you, Maria. Maybe uh, uh, Václav Šana is there. I don't know how do we proceed if we if we give feedback immediately or shall we proceed as uh, yesterday with all the other presenters first? Shall we proceed? Okay. So we will call uh, the next presenter, uh, Miss uh, Katerina. Of, uh, is, is it okay? Uh, Miss Katerina on a research title, um, uh, sh Shrinking Cities Alternative Ways of Urban Planning. So the first of course is yours. Are you ready? Thank you. Right. I'll try to share. Just a second. I don't know if it says to switch to a desktop, desktop app. Sorry, I'm, I think I have a technical issue because I'm not on a desktop app. I'm just in a browser, so I can't share. So I'll just need to um, install the app. Sorry about that. No worries, no worries. Okay, uh, uh, okay. Would you like uh, to send it to us, and then we will help you to uh, to share the the file for you. I think I think I, I think Václav Shana can can be the next. Okay, okay, sure. Vašku, můžeš nás dívat? Václav, can you, sh can you share your presentation? Yes, of course. I'm, first, I want to say.
face, sorry, because I have a wrong time, so I will, but uh, uh, I could share my screen right now and uh, I could present to you the whole presentation. Yes, yes. you see my. Yeah, we can see. Uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, we can see, can see your screen, Václave, but uh, but uh, you are a little bit, uh, you know, the loudness is might be better. So if you can talk a little bit louder, louder. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. Of course. Okay. Uh, well, would, uh, start with my presentation. So thank you for me. And uh, first one, I would like to introduce myself. So I'm here of the Faculty of Architecture in Brno. I have just studied here uh, for bachelor and uh, did my master thesis here. I made made a lot of friends and uh, like, uh, uh, found a lot of interesting topics uh, formating me. Like in uh, right now, right now I'm a PhD uh, here, and uh, so I divided my sorry. Okay. Well, uh, so I divided uh, my presentation into two parts. The first part is uh, my diploma project, and the second part is uh, uh, my uh, my dissertation, like PhD PhD thesis, uh, which I'm working right now. But uh, it's a continuing job. So I first one I try to put uh, the first part here. So it was the uh, my master thesis was the material history of urban and uh, my just, uh, like create work which would be like uh, really complex and which would be uh, like uh, which would go on the uh, on the borders of what architecture and urbanism is and uh, I try to it's a little bit different than uh, this. Uh, uh, made uh, in our faculty and uh, I work on it uh, uh, three semesters. So the time of this project was three semesters. And uh, first one, I ask myself, what is the countryside? And, uh, and uh, is something like, uh, is some, is, uh, uh, is something between a rural and urban place, or is it uh, in modern times something which is really similar or anything else? And so I start with the uh, with the Enclosure Act, uh, which was made in uh, Britain in uh, 18 and 19th century. It was uh, like the urban uh, like landscape. Uh, uh, landscape agriculture changes, uh, which already uh, leads to industrial uh, revolution and made also the agriculture revolution because the landscape is really connected with agriculture. So that was also the main topic. And here I, uh, so it's the Enclosure Act in Britain. And here you can see the differences between the, how fields and agriculture change uh, our planet, like from uh, from the upside, uh, we we could see that uh, like different shapes of uh, agricultural lands uh, makes our planet uh, like uh, like our global world uh, uh, like uh, I would say like interesting from from the space, but also we could see that how we not only through the urban uh, development, but also through the rural and agriculture development could change the shape of, uh, of uh, our, uh, our uh, landscape area. So, uh, well, I, I already said that uh, here uh, in that time in 21st century, the modern arch architecture, uh, agriculture has already the industrial character 
So we could see that this is the industrial character of uh, harvesting in, uh, I think it's uh, in Texas. Here is it in the Netherlands, the green, uh, the greenhouse, which uh, maybe you already know that uh, Netherlands is uh, like a superpower in agriculture and it's mainly because of technology and their, uh, um, and their uh, like agriculture management. So um, I'll, I create this type of uh, graph, uh, graphic, uh, which uh, actually, uh, this is some kind of hypothesis. So here is a countryside. And, uh, and uh, if we go through the time, like from the beginning, we could see that the most, most of people work in uh, agriculture and countryside is mainly connected with agriculture. But uh, when the industrial revolution came, uh, it becomes, uh, the world becomes more urbanized. And today, the agriculture is mainly connected with uh, industry. It's maybe not the agriculture itself, but it's maybe more industry uh, sector. So, and today, uh, countryside is maybe the rural illusion which we look at it and we uh, idealize idealize the countryside with uh, nice houses uh, in the nature and in uh, in a nice landscape but maybe it is only illusion because also people who live in the countryside mostly didn't work at uh, agriculture so today's agriculture looks like this and it could be even uh, in the urban era so and uh, so I also think about the thing that uh, that uh, today's global war is uh, uh, is uh, really connected with uh, material sources. And for me, this is also the, like my hypothesis. There is a three main uh, material sources, and this is a uh, fresh water, energy production and food production. Between them, there is a logistic, because we are in a global world and uh, all of these free material sources uh, travel to the continents. And it's also important, uh, it's also important for the demography, because we need more energy in a small, in a small land area or uh, we need a less less food for like bigger area which actually is not uh, so developed uh, demographically well, and uh, this was uh, the question that uh, if we could imagine that uh, we have already we could already reach 10, 10 billion people so where is the enough cropland for the for the food production? And it's also food is also highly connected with energy and with with water because today's uh, as I says that today's uh, industrial agriculture you need a lot of energy put in this and you need a lot of fresh water and uh, that's the main problem because it becomes uh, unsustainable. And uh, where is the new uh, era for agriculture production? So, and for me, I try to finish uh, my diplomat thesis with uh, with uh, with the main project, which uh, try to find this new rural area for uh, agriculture. And I look at the ocean, and it's mostly because that on the ocean you have, uh, the, like, uh, you have uh, inside rain. There is a fresh, uh, fresh water. The sun uh, heats uh, the same uh, same way as uh, you are on the continent, and the winds uh, behaves the same way. So I designed a, a vertical floating vertical farm on the ocean. Uh, which go, I call them pilgrim, which, and this is the 
like a case situation, the case study uh, about uh, like the connection between uh, uh, between two African uh, vertical uh, the floating vertical farm floats like floats. And during the uh, like some organized system and in this like some far here. I am here from architect to design and and so uh, as well, like, as I'm the mechanical engineer, so, uh, my ideal position would be to have uh, the research team of 50 people and uh, try to do it and uh, even build this kind, uh, <laughs> this kind of uh, system or something similar. But uh, that was the, uh, uh, like, uh, we were on the end of the project and I tried to finish it with, uh, with uh, not only the analysis, but uh, also with uh, the project and architecture project itself. So it's uh, like maybe it has the vertical system and the horizontal system. Uh, it has a shape and construction, uh, uh, shape and uh, construction system. So maybe it's uh, for a longer, um, for a longer uh, uh, explanation. Uh, so it's the axonometry, it's like a floating vertical farm. And I think about it that there is a quantity of them and they uh, redistribute fruits and the areas uh, around, uh, around the uh, coasts of ocean could grow because they have uh, enough, uh, enough food and enough agriculture, uh, enough food, food and agriculture production. So this is uh, like the... Uh, this is the uh, case study about the uh, Perth uh, city in Australia. Uh, and well, uh, here I'm on uh, part two. Uh, that I would like to say that uh, I try to continue with my PhD with my PhD thesis uh, on this topic, but uh, it was. Uh, it was a little bit different, but uh, it is a little bit connected because when I made the research on uh, like uh, on my diploma project, I also researched the uh, water and uh, like uh, water consumption and uh, like through the, not only through the architecture but also through the urbanis urbanism. So I choose the topic, which was called water areas as a potential for city and village activities, which I did right now uh, through my supervisor, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Katarzyna uh, dokupala Pazerkova. And well, uh, the first problems and the first question was, uh, like how to define this topic and uh, for me also how to use uh, my knowledge which I did uh, through, the, through my diplomatists. And uh, so what is the topic area? So where the water starts, uh, like water as a topic starts and where it ends in urbanism. And uh, water as a specific term in uh, urbanism, because it's also for, for me, it's not uh, that clear as it, as it looks because you could imagine almost everything uh, with uh, water in with the term water in urbanism. And uh, so, for me, the first one I try to define uh, terms for myself. So, what is uh, water areas? What is uh, city and village activities? And uh, and uh, like, uh, what is an uh, active approach in urbanism? Uh, so this was uh, some kind of my hypothesis that I divide. Uh, uh, I try to 
put uh, active approach in opposition of, uh, I would say, the authoritarian approach in urbanism, just so that you have a like a strong uh, and uh, really powerful uh, like a, a, like a urban designer who did uh, his decisions. But for me, it's it was that uh, I should work uh, more like uh, like with the quantity of uh, small urban uh, uh, like uh, of small urban project projects and uh, propositions. Well, so that was the like uh, for me for me really important how to define these uh, special these two terms. Uh, I already wrote an article for our uh, conference in architecture and urbanism, which uh, like um, it was mainly about what is the active approach and uh, what it could be like uh, through the it could be through the water areas and like that. Uh, and yeah, that's the is the like ecological like transport context cultural context and social context and uh, it's that is uh, the poster which was on the on the annual conference and uh, for me it uh, is really important right now that uh, i already find uh, like uh, my research area it's a floodplain forest with the uh, surrounding cities and villages which is close to, it's like 100 kilometer close to Brno city. It's uh, next to city of Olomouc. And this is a flatland area. Like uh, I would say, uh, there is a, like one city which is in the middle. It's a city called Litoval. Is it called uh, Moravian Venice? Because it has uh, like seven rivers which goes through, through, the, through the city. And the surrounding area, which goes uh, around this, uh, is uh, little. It's called Little Scapo Moravi. It's a uh, floodplain forest. It's like a river basin, as you could see uh, here. That you have the the main river is uh, River Morava, but it uh, has uh, even the floodplain forest. It's some kind of a water area itself. Uh, here, for example, I try to put uh, the, the floodplains area in that, uh, and as you could see, that uh, the southern uh, area of Little Moravi is already under this floodplains area, which is, uh, I, I think, it's like five, uh, five years floods, uh, 20 years floods, and uh, 100 years floods. So, and uh, here is the urban settlement, which uh, mostly goes around it. There is a, like, uh, this free, uh, like, maybe four is, like, four. Uh, uh, there's, a, uh, there's already four, uh, one city. And Era, but most of them is uh, surrounding and uh, there is a for me it's really in, uh, interesting uh, to see uh, the borders between this urban uh, rural and landscape I would say and uh, it's really interesting for me to research it as a as a as a topic like water urban rural or landscape area so and uh, also there is a uh, for me i try to research it uh, not only through maps but also through historical events there was a two extreme climate historical uh, uh, climate uh, disaster, historical disasters in Litovel and uh, like uh, I would say recent time, but uh, there was uh, like uh, floods in 1997, which uh, almost totally like destroys the 
city surrounding. You could see, for example, here is a historical city center which was founded in, um, in the Middle Age. And uh, you could see that uh, these surrounding cities already protected from the floods, but uh, surroundings not, because they were not designed to be protected against, against the floods. And uh, even today, the city has uh, problems with uh, some bigger uh, floods which happens, uh, like I would say, uh, every five year. And there was a tornado in uh, 20, uh, 20, zero, uh, 2000, uh, 2004. And uh, here in Europe, you mostly don't have tornadoes. Uh, and uh, that was the first tornado which happens in, uh, in uh, Czech Republic. And uh, it also goes through the city. And uh, it was something uh, for, for for people in the city of Litovel, it was something what they didn't uh, didn't uh, see any time before, and uh, and it was also like the uh, human like in a smaller scale, but a human catastrophe for uh, for that city. Well, and uh, there is uh, my plans, which I want to research uh, in the future. Uh, I actually have a plan to do the case study in uh, selected and chosen location uh, locations in uh, Litovalské Pomoraví and surroundings and, uh, in also, and work also in a different scales uh, uh, to do some methodological and urbanist comparison of these selected places and uh, wrote uh, some text, uh, like, uh, like scientific text reports of each place and each situations. And in the future, like, uh, I would like to com compare this situation, uh, no, compare, compare this with uh, situations abroad with the same type of uh, research context. So I would like to choose a similar era uh, like a uh, uh, similar era abroad and try to do the same type of research and uh, and to make a comparison between Czech con uh, context in Czech Republic and context in a foreign country. So thank you for your attention and uh, that's, that's all. Thank you very much uh, for the uh, presentation uh, just now. Very interesting topic. Okay, let's move on to our next presenter, uh, Miss Katerina. Are you ready? So, if it's you ready, the pause is yours. Thank you. Can you can you add uh, Miss Katerina into into the meeting because she's she's waiting. Uh, she and installed. The the... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. sure how to add her from the lobby so can uh, my team help me here Wait. Um, uh, can you click the name and then right click the name right click the name yeah, okay. try that. um it's it's not vaclav right it is katerina uh, Kat katerina right i couldn't i couldn't yeah. find her i couldn't find her she's not on the list Katerina Sebaska. Yeah, she she's she's not on she's not in the list of the participants. So um probably can she can log in again because she's not even in the lobby. Yeah. Is it possible if she can log in back again? Or, or is it that we can? Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I can. Uh, I will, uh, uh, I'm sending her a, a message. So, so I will, uh, I will ask her to log in again. Okay, no worries on that one. So I think we can proceed with the uh, question and answer session, and then when she comes back to the room, we can um, listen to a presentation. Is it okay, um, Doctor Radit? Is it fine with you? Yeah, it, it is okay. 
Okay, good, good. So, Dr. Sharia, maybe you can guide the, the panel for the question and answer session. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, so if you uh, so the panels, uh, if you have any questions to ask the uh, presenter, you may do so. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, the floor is yours. Yeah, anyone uh, from the panels? Shall I start first? Yes, yes, please. Okay. Okay. Yes. Go ahead. Right. Um. Um. I think I'm. I'm just going to comment uh, generally first. I think both of the um. Uh, topic are quite interesting. Uh, personally, myself, and I, I, I mean, um, I, I'm, I'm quite surprised that um, uh, some of the topics that can be uh, uh, very local, but at the same time, it can be quite uh, global, in uh, on on some of the topics. Um, if I may uh, comment on the first one, uh, by Marie uh, Georgia, yeah, um, I think th this um, uh, puts a, a different path to to the way PhD research are being uh, always been disseminated. It's always uh, normally PhD are always uh, within the compound of the campuses, uh, but now you 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 proven that uh, it can also be uh, 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 disseminated in other ways like media, uh, social media and and websites like Archipop. I think this is quite a interesting uh, uh, way to somehow uh, um, uh, share your knowledge at the same time um, to have a structured kind of uh, uh, knowledge collection and and it's in that you might use is that database right database of of all these interesting uh, architectural uh, urban intervention I think this is quite interesting um, uh, the question will be in terms of that particular archipelag will be like uh, will it be some sort of a, um, an open source uh, because uh, you know like up daily they, they compile all these projects submitted by people um it becomes some sort of some sort of a newsletter um a website uh, I, I think you, you can do a bit more uh, in uh, better than that in the sense that it can be some sort of a knowledge creation uh, uh not just a database of information and images but how people could actually learn and and uh, uh, employ them uh, within their particular local i think that, that is what your manual is going to be basically uh, if I may, I refer the word um, uh, toolkit. I'm not sure whether that is uh, uh, something that you you you've used for. Uh, toolkit is much more uh, 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 what do you call it, flexible in the sense that it, it gives uh, some sort of a. Uh, uh, it's it's not a manual that people have to follow, but a toolkit is much more uh, of a thing that you can uh, copy and paste. You can take here and there uh, of some sort. Yeah. So. Um, and uh, uh, the, you mentioned about this temporariness. I think this is quite interesting as well, um, in the sense that uh, all these structures are, uh, are temporary. But uh, I, I'm hoping that probably uh, you could look into uh, something uh, of, a, uh, of a merit for some of these projects in terms of their uh, impact towards society, towards the, the, the locality. I think uh, that is what's what missing, especially in, in, in normal websites like Dizine or, or UpDaily. You don't have that parameters of uh, uh, how much impact do they give. It looks nice and beautiful, but at the same time, it doesn't have impact. It's just there for the sake of, of being there. And it's, it's always the case that uh, people take uh, some sort of a seed money, grant money, and they, they built it. Um, and we, we never know uh, how, how does it uh, contribute back to the actual society. Okay. Um, and then you mentioned, you mentioned about agency. I think um, uh, that is uh, something. Um, uh, uh, in, uh, what do you call that? Important to, to mention about this, um, uh, but I, I I was wondering. Uh, I question in terms of. Um, uh, I mean, uh, in the end, we, will uh, will the toolkit or the manual be some sort of a uh, a thing uh, to just build within a particular space, or or there must be some sort of parameters for designers to to really uh, look into, rather than uh, beautiful uh, images. They look into. Uh, the the impact of that particular thing, uh, in terms of society, in terms of the social uh, aspect, and so forth. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I I I think it will be a, a bit a, a quite interesting um, if you could look at like for example, uh, you know, wiki houses, wiki structures. They are open source. They they are there to help people to to uh, to start uh, from somewhere. Right? And, and and somehow uh, uh, put it within uh, the particular context. 
Do they share certain details that people can use you know, files, uh, online uh, digital, um, uh, what do you call that, tools that they can use for them to really uh, curate it within the boundary of the context? And, and th that, that could be uh, 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 more impactful um, uh, rather than just telling people what to do here and there uh, without uh, some sort of a grounded kind of um, uh, details for them to, to start with or to, to use and, and employ uh, straight away. Yeah, because um, um, these kind of structures are temporary and it needs to be quick. And, and some, sometimes um, uh, people don't, doesn't have that capacity to, to start from, from scratch. Yeah. Um, that is only for the first presenter. Uh, can I continue for the second presenter? Okay, yeah. Uh, quickly on, on the second presenter. Yes. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you for hmm. the, this point of view because uh, I think it's very important to move it forward, not just to mention, but also the impact and the toolkit is a very nice slogan for it. So thank you. Okay. Um, and then the second one by Vaclav um, uh, Sana. I, I have a, list, a lot of um, comments, but I'm going to focus on, on a few things. Um, um, yeah, I, I think I think uh, I applaud you to to look at uh, your previous projects as a case study. I think that's wonderful to 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 do. Uh, I mean, in the sense that it creates this kind of uh, progression in terms of knowledge that, that you have, and I think it's some sort of a a, a, a way. I think for for PhD students to to somehow reflect back on the things that they have learned, the things that they have seen. Um, it's not just uh, uh, to start fresh uh, from whatever they have uh, uh, during the start of the PhD. And um, mm, yeah, the, the Ocean Highways case study uh, or projects that you did, um, I mean, th that, that creates a lot of questions uh, for myself, but I think uh, that's a way forward. Uh, you, lo lo you look at the future as well, uh, you look at technology and, and you, you're talking about multidisciplinary. I think both of these uh, projects are multidisciplinary in, in nature. I think we cannot run away from, from that uh, at a particular moment. Um, and then when you talk about this active urbanism, um, I, I think although you have a lot more to, to, to do with the PhD, um, uh, yeah, but talking about, uh, talking about water and also terrain, I think, uh, it, I mean, personally, I think it's quite challenging um, um, a topic to work with, um, but it, it can be uh, uh, done by looking at uh, not just the nature, but also the, the aspect of social, right? social aspect and and the acceptance of people towards uh, technology or towards uh, their the natural surrounding uh, which i think is pertinent nowadays because even in malaysia we do have a lot of nat natural um, uh, catastrophes uh, uh, flat plains uh, f f flats and, and all that which is uh, also derived from from the the human hand as well the, the people who built right especially architects so i think um um, it reminds me, uh, if we talk about water, it, it reminds me not just um, uh, a natural phenomenon, but it can also be a political thing. Like, for example, if you look at Palestine and uh, Israeli conflict, it's not just the, 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 the cost of land, but also the, the, uh, the water becomes a political tool in between them. So I think it's quite, quite a powerful statement uh, there as well. And, and uh, I think in Malaysia as well, um, floods, for example, they are becoming uh, some sort of festives rather than um, a nuisance sometimes. Uh, if, it, if it gets too big, I think that, that is a, a catastrophe, but if it's just small, it's, it's very festive. People, people play with uh, water during the floods. I think that's about it. Uh, thank you, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ayman, for the comment uh, data just now. Okay, uh, since that we can see that uh, Katerina is here, would you like to proceed with your presentations? Are you ready? And, uh, yes, thank you very much. I'm very sorry for the technical issues. It's okay. You may proceed. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I'm just... Can you see my uh, screen or not yet? Not yet. Not yet. Yeah. Mm, 
I'm sorry, I'm just a new Mac user and it's uh, much more complicated <laughs> for okay. me. It... So, okay, uh, well, while waiting, uh, let's hear uh, uh, comments from uh, maybe from uh, Associate Prof. Uh, Dr. Carol. Uh, would you like to give some comments from our presenter, first presenter and second presenter just now? Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sharia. Uh, thank you, uh, presenters. Uh, uh, Mary Joja and also Vekla. Uh, soon we'll have uh, um, Katrina. Yeah? So I, I, I'm assuming that uh, I'm covering the first two early ones, which is Mary and uh, Vekla. Yeah. All right. Um, is that right to call you Marie or Maria? Sure. Marie, yeah? Yeah, you can. Okay, um, uh, the first impression is that uh, I, I think uh, um, one would wonder uh, as to whether uh, uh, you are, you are you, both of you or the three of you are actually undertaking PhD. I presumably uh, uh, all of you are, are undertaking a PhD and hence we have this PhD colloquium. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes, uh, uh, I think in the case of uh, Marie, uh, in uh, with regards to the proposal, the, the proposal that you have, um, I, I have so, I'm I'm some somehow um, zigzagging myself between a design and a research. You know, um, so uh, at times I, I wonder whether 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 it is a design that you're proposing, or you or you actually uh, uh, proposing some kind of a research initiatives that are led by certain questions, certain questions that are bugging your mind, <laughs> you know, um, uh, and uh, well, I, I, I think that is not a problem because because uh, with design, you do you, you do certainly have some kind of adventurism with research. Uh, if you if one is to undertake purely research, then it could lead to boredom, you know, it could lead to some some uh, cul de sac uh, that you mean, but but having uh, to be to be honest, having look at your uh, presentation, um uh let me just uh, let me just uh, recall um uh, because i don't want to actually uh, put this uh, this idea this initiative within the realm of library science which is information science uh, uh because uh, it, it it does it does seem as though that uh, 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 like like i said before it, it does seem as though that you are going for a kind of a design site based temporal uh, which is to, which is which is uh, which is a kind of a place making tool. Uh, I think uh, well, basically mentioned as the, by Dr. Ayman, is now as a, a kind of a toolkit uh, uh, or or some kind of a instrument uh, apparatus. Uh, but but does that does how does that actually feed uh, into this whole idea of research, this critical idea of research? You know, I, I was wondering along the way. Um, uh, well, perhaps maybe maybe if we were to actually reframe uh, reframe the context of the study, for example, there are there are I mean uh, of late we have lo a lot of uh, research which uh, which uh, deals with socially inclined uh, subject yeah. matter. Uh, for example, you have uh, uh, what we have uh, as a participatory architecture uh, uh, and also collaborative architecture. These are these are these are currencies that are gaining ground very rapidly nowadays because we are we are more or less like uh, uh, leaving the decisions to the people rather than leaving it to the policymakers. I think there's a there's a problem when 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 we actually uh, leave uh, uh, issues purely at the hands and at the behest of policymakers or the so-called leaderships. So so I think I think this is a, an effort uh, in your case. This is an effort to actually uh, allow this amount of decision making in the hands of the people, the public, uh, and and uh, therewith uh, comes the question of how we actually do it. You know, uh, because because uh, this I think this is where you can posit questions, critical questions, crit critical research questions with regard to this. You know, and and also the fact uh, this is the, the big issue, whether whether uh, architecture can play a role. You know. Uh, Otherwise, you would leave to to information scientists to actually devise instruments. 
you know, or to actually uh, engage and participate in 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 uh, temporal public place making activities, you know. But 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 then the question comes in: How does architecture play its role? You know, uh, uh, when we talk about architecture, are, are you saying architecture as in capital A or in small A? You know, uh, you know what I mean. Because yeah. uh, we, are you talking about architecture of uh, the opera houses, performance centers, uh, big? massive buildings or are you talking about the people kind of architecture with just a small a so 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 i think i think putting architecture into into this perspective uh can actually give this this uh, uh this direction that you're you're taking you know uh and and uh and also uh, the fact that you know at the moment i think it's you, you're gonna have tough time determining the scale <laughs> because because yeah. uh I think uh, uh, when, when you have uh, 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 when come to the subject matter of research, the idea of limitation and scale and scope comes into mind. Uh, because because uh, 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 I think a researcher who has an idea of limitation and scope will probably be someone who actually knows his or her stuff with regards to research, uh, and not to leave it open. You know, so so in this situation, yeah, you're dealing with temporal spaces, but. Aren't you a bit, uh, uh, you know, overwhelmed by the fact that there's so huge amount areas of temporal spaces around? You know, you could have a you could have a highway that runs over from one land to another that has got uh, the underside of the the, the carriageway has uh, offering a huge amount of spaces for 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 negotiations, for discussion, for mediations. You know, so so so. Uh, can we afford to see highways as, as being uh, the information, uh, you know, hub, you know, uh, critical hub for for this public uh, discussion, you know? So so you have this kind of a, an opening up of huge potential, definitely. I mean, uh, as far as yours concerned, I think there is de definitely uh, uh, an opportunity, uh, maybe to add uh, to 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 help you a bit. Probably is to actually to de determine the, the the nature space of place. You know uh, that 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 uh, that is going that is going to have this hap uh, you know happening all around the cities you know things like that. So so I think uh, you, you, uh, your task is uh, one of them could probably be to actually uh, uh, you know uh, to actually circumscribe the area the realm the physicality of this. I think this is something that 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 uh, uh, may be a challenge because because uh, when you talk about uh, collaboration participation mediation. Uh, a, a, a prediction of information, you know, it does not give any connotation of space, physicality of space and place. That's that's a challenge. Well, but then I think this could be a, a, a fantastic research question that you might throw in. You know, whether you need space, whether you need place to actually inculcate uh, 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 to to trigger data and information uh, from the public. You know, uh, so so. And also the fact that uh, when you say uh, uh, being a, a kind of a predict predictor of temporal spaces, I mean that also puts you into into uh, the realm of facilities management. I don't know whether you have in in the, in Czech uh, um, Republic uh, you 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 have uh, this this area of uh, facilities management in place as part of the property. You know, so so in other words, uh, you you may have to cross discipline. To be able to actually deal with this, you know, so 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 may, maybe the data that you are looking for uh, is is fully in the hands of uh, facilities managers uh, and property managers, uh, and and, yes. and perhaps you might want to actually inculcate the design framework of how you actually deal with this, you know, so so property managers um, uh, may uh, or facilities manager managers may actually be the ones who actually uh, present the tangible uh, dimension of the project, you know, but you will be as an architect, you know, uh, as, as an architect involved in research, I think the research will probably be something that that uh, does a bit more critical uh, 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 involve you more critical dimension of this this kind of research. So I think I think there's a yeah, I think I think uh, there's a huge potential uh, uh, in, 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 in dealing with this and is the, the outcome might be a fantastic one. You know, it's it's uh, it's. Uh, uh, but but maybe put yourself in which them who are you you know uh, which domain what you would you want to be would you want the PhD to be to be uh, examined by people from library science for example purely information do you want the 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 the, the, the PhD to be actually dealt with by people from facilities and property uh, and so on so 
and of course i think i would gather that uh, that you want this uh, this uh, phd to be actually be examined by people from architecture right <laughs> yeah. yeah so so uh, in other words uh, we as architects uh, who who among us who will probably be, pot be potentially be examiners would, would actually be have to well be well equipped so at the moment i don't think architects <laughs> are actually well equipped in 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 dealing with this uh, uh, you know so so you'd have to find us a slot <laughs> to actually yeah. talk about your work you know well anyway uh, uh, it's it's wonderful to uh, to actually uh, discuss uh, this with you um, mary yeah? uh, i have uh, to agree yeah. Yeah, so I have, I have to move on to uh, Vaclav, uh, uh, and uh, wow, this is uh, also another uh, another uh, di diversion <laughs> from 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 um, from uh, the 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 rigidly place based physical based architecture. Uh, but actually, I I, I do I do uh, uh, have uh, uh, I do understand perfectly because one of my students actually conducted. Uh, a design of this uh, 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 in somewhere in the mangrove swamp areas of Malaysia. So, so, so I, th I think uh, I think this is leading on to your later part of your presentation where you you actually talk about water base, uh, but then you moved on earlier on from from uh, questioning. Uh, you know, um, you're basically actually trying to find the implication of urbanization uh, 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 all throughout the stages of uh, all throughout the the earth surfaces. You know, basically, so they are moving from countryside. Uh, and then uh, it moves on all, all the way to to uh, you know uh, 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 what do you call it uh, uh, this this dichotomy between rural countryside and urban you know uh, you 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 are keeping you keep finding a, a, a meaning in the interfaces between rural and urban so you find that uh, you'll find this these events uh, happen uh, significantly nowadays where you have urbanization happening. And actually, uh, if you look at the uh, phenomenon of urban sprawl and urban shrinkage, uh, the people in land management, they, they, they usually associate this with uh, land use. You know, uh, they have no other way to interpret it. But I think as architects, I think, I think we could say that, for example, uh, the phenomenon of sprawl and land use, the movements of people between areas. So in other words, you, you'd find uh, if you use people as the, the currency or measure, uh, you'll find that people move from countryside, urban, rural, even to the waters, waterfront. So you have uh, you, you have uh, uh, pockets of development that actually reflect more on the people movement rather than the actual demarcation of urban and rural. So I think I think I think it's it's, it's basically uh, are we looking at at, at a, 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 a glass that is half empty or half full? You know, so so it's, it depends. I think from the uh, it will be good actually to actually uh, venture into the PhD from the perspective of an architect, where where you 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 use the mo people movement as 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 a kind of a, a, a detector or predictor or anticipator of 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 uh, of the outcomes. You know, uh, as opposed to uh, planners, urban planners and land uh, land managers, they actually use the land. <laughs> The physicality of land. So, so I think I think you you could actually uh, uh, see this happening, and and, and uh, I mean, yeah, I, uh, uh, and if I, I would assume that you you are probably uh, towards the end of your presentation that you are very much interested in the water base development. Uh, if I'm if I'm right, you know, you could you know, it's it's like, uh, uh, and and I think uh, um, issues of sustainability might be very very crucial in this. Because uh, I think if recently you you showed some slides uh, where you have uh, occasions where you have flooding, right? Uh, whereas in Malaysia we we recently have uh, massive destructive flooding, and everybody's speculating, <laughs> and and speculation about what causes these floods. Uh, actually, um, uh, actually, uh, if you were to wonder, it actually may be caused by man made man built stuff, you know. Which is probably related directly to architecture, you know, and 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 in, in other words, we we share as much as the destruction. We 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 probably share the responsibility to destruction as much as probably we tend to associate with uh, ecological uh, sources, you know, like uh, you know. But it's actually uh, architecture is probably one of the culprits <laughs> uh, or, or misunderstanding about architectural principles, you know. So I think in this situation, um, it would apply as as to, you know from because at the moment you are venturing an area which is probably the most virgin of all the areas which is the ocean 
Okay, uh, Professor. Okay, uh, uh, sorry, we have. Uh, okay. uh, we have. I'm so sorry. Okay. Uh, as you said. Uh, okay. Well, thank you very much, uh, as you said, Prof. Uh, Dr. Cairo, for uh, insightful and thoughtful. Uh, so I hope that presenter uh, able to get the comments from uh, Professor Dr. Cairo. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so let's uh, without further delay. So let's uh, move to uh, Miss Katerina. You ready? So I hope that you're ready. Yes, sorry. Uh, Radek will be my screen, so he will screen okay, no my problem. screen, and I will be presenting. So please, okay. Radek. Okay. Call the best. Thank you very much, and uh, once again, sorry for the delay and for the technical issues. Uh, my name is Katerina Chenovska, and I'm the I'm a first year uh, PhD student. So, this presentation is something like a introduction what my research will be about because I'm not as far uh, ahead in the research. We can go to the next uh, slide. The theme uh, is uh, shrinking cities and alternative ways of planning. This is the first idea of uh, what the PhD research should be about. And uh, this is just like an introduction to this theme that uh, now we live in a urban structure, which is be, uh, which is culturalized and uh, the surrounded landscape around us is not as wild as it uh, used to be. But it's changing. It's not um, as uh, Maria was saying in her projects. All uh, the sites can be derelict because the urban structure is changing, and the wildness or wilderness is coming back to the cities. But it's not the same as it used to be in the beginning. So it, it, this is just like the introduction. What makes me um, interested in the topic, which uh, is how the wilderness comes back to the city and what happens in the city and uh, this theme is uh, strongly connected with the theme of a shrinking city so we can go to the next slide and sh uh, shrinking city can be defined like an urban area so it doesn't have to be a whole city it can be just a part of the city just the urban structure which uh, suffers from a population loss and uh, connected with the population loss is uh, most uh, likely economic downturn, uh, employment decline, so there are no jobs for the uh, people and uh, other social problems. So it's a whole thing uh, connected, I would say. Can go to the next slide. Uh, the first person which got me interested in this uh, topic is Philip Oswald, which um, is, I would say, a medializer or <laughs> something like that, uh, a person who talked about shrinking cities a lot. Uh, and he was the one who I think made the term uh, popular. And um, he talks about the, these big shrinking cities, which is, for example, Detroit or um, other shrinking cities, which are um, massively, uh, which uh, had a massive uh, population decline. But uh, I was studying this uh, kind of cities, but I would like to go back to the Czech environment and may, maybe focus less on uh, smaller towns and cities can go to the next slide. And uh, when we say shrinking city, we say population decline, you have the word decline in the uh, in the name, basically, and uh, you have uh, these kind of pictures connected with the term of shrinking city, which means that uh, if someone says shrinking city, you might uh, see uh, urban decline or uh, all these negative terms which are connected with uh, the thought of a city which is shrinking which i think it's not uh, something which would be uh, which should be automatic i uh, guess this looks dangerous this doesn't seem nice to you and uh, you don't think that this is something uh, you want your urban structure or your city to look like but uh, as we uh, as we said, the movement of people throughout 
all the world from a uh, ruler to ur more urban environment it's happening and it's happening all the time and it's something that we need to look at as a, a natural process and not as a bad thing which is happening to the urban structure the phd project is based on my diploma project which uh, was called urban wilderness postcultural area and i was researching the team a little bit more but uh, more or less it was connected to urban wilderness so how the wilderness come back to the cities and to shrinking cities which gave it more space to uh, grow and uh, I would like to show you on this project uh, on one particular town how I uh, approach the team and what is uh, what should be the outcome of the PhD project long ahead. <laughs> this is a simplified uh, shrinking city identification. So basically, I took uh, all the cities in Czech Republic. Uh, which is which were uh, the statute on the of the city has a city which has more than three thousand inhabitants, and uh, uh, you can see you can see if there is a population decline or not, and if the population decline is more than three uh, percent between uh, it was last ten years when I was doing the diploma projects, then I said uh, yes, this might be a shrinking city, and let's put it on the list, and we'll see what happens. And I found out Czech Republic is quite a small area and there are 607 cities in year 2019. And I found out that 187 uh, cities from the, this total number is actually shrinking more than 3%. And you can see on the graph below that uh, more cities <laughs> from our 187 is actually shrinking more than uh, 5%, uh, which means that it's not um, a problem which would be like drastic. So you, you cannot see a big city which suddenly uh, lo um, lose a population, which is very significant, but it's something which is very uh, slow and invisible, but it's happening and we should um, approach this team why we should uh, why or how uh, we can plan the cities to uh, approach this problem or so-called problem yeah so this is a perfect model of a city you have an urban structure which has some kind of population and it is built for this kind of population let's say when we go to the ne next slide this is a typical model of a growing city if the population of the city grows it means the economic uh, of the city is growing as well the city is doing well and the city is also growing in the urban structure and it uh, goes more over in the land when we go to the next slide this is a model of a stagnant city so it means that the population doesn't uh, go uh, over it's still the same but the urban structure of the city or of the czech city i would say it's when when we have these zoning plans it's always planned for um, growth so uh, this is how it is and this is the same thing with the shrinking city population declines but the zoning plan or the development plan for the urban structure of the city is always the same and it doesn't recall what is happening with the population or what the economic loss. Go to the next slide. This is just an example of the town of Vimperk, which was uh, the theme of my diploma project, which is a small town of uh, almost 8,000 uh, inhabitants so it's very slow but you can see uh, very small sorry <laughs> but you can see that the population loss is happening and it's probably going to happen in last uh, in years ahead which means that the city doesn't get new uh, people and if 
it's not a bad thing, but we should think about it, how to plan cities like that, or how to um, do these zoning, zonings planned in a way that it's, uh, it can uh, be in a way of a growth, in a way of stagnation, or in a way of a shrinkage. This is just for uh, you to see how the urban structure of uh, Wimperk uh, looks like. And when we go to the next slide, this is uh, the zoning plan and the pink areas are all the areas which are supposed to be built up because uh, all the people in Czech Republic wants to, uh, want to live in uh, single family houses. So the urban structure of the new built up areas looks uh, completely different than the urban structure which was uh, built before and uh, I think that this problem is more um, you can see it more in these small towns because there are no um, large developers which would uh, or uh, city co-working with developers which would uh, think about the built up structure in a better way than just to say this area is for you. We can give you a site and you can build a family house there and people are happy. But uh, what happens with a town like that? It will spread over in in the landscape and the population uh, will be um, smaller and smaller. So my question is, what is the alternative way of planning cities and if there is a way of um, planning the cities in a way that we have the these types of zonings plan which if the urban structure is growing or if the population is growing means the urban structure is growing but in the same way if the population stagnates or it's uh, shrinking that the urban structure reacts to a problem which is uh, happening at the yeah, and uh, the last slide is uh, how can it affect us, which is just a point that I would like to say that uh, I would like to focus on human scale as well. So this is like a, like a view from an urban planner, I would say, but I think it affects the population and the people in the city the most because uh, they are the people who actually stay in the city and um, I would like to um, look at this from the social point of view or maybe co-work with the different um, uh, different universities or faculties on this kind of problem how it can uh, affect the people uh, living in the city or how can the people affect the urban planning. Yeah, <laughs> that's, uh, that's it, I would say. Thank you for your attention. Okay, well, okay. thank you, Katrina, for the uh, interesting topic. Okay, uh, let's listen uh, to Dr. Faisal for a uh, commentator on the first presenter, second and third. And then we'll go to Dr. Ayman for third present for comments on the third presenter and uh, Dr. Cairo for uh, comments, yeah? Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you, moderator. Can you hear me? Yeah? yeah. Okay, uh, let's start with Mary. Okay, um, I won't um, talk like um, too much about this here yeah, because I think most of it has been has been uh, talked by the the other two panels yeah. Um, I'm I'm quite um, uh, to say interested with your project yeah, with your research yeah. It's quite interesting yeah, and then uh, I think this kind of approach has been applied. Um, into the other regions, yeah, like in the Asia, yeah, like, like in, in Thailand, like in Indonesia, yeah. So, so I think it's good. Um, but I think uh, the manual that you have uh, created, yeah, based on your case study, I think it is from the case study from Europe, right? The manual. Uh, no, the manual is still in progress. And I want to, uh, yeah, this, this will be about the steps to make the temporary uh, activities on a particular place. 
Okay, but those those based on it in the Europe, right? Yeah, sure. Okay, how about the the that manual? Can you make like make a comparison with the other regions, right? In the Asia's, yeah. Uh, because um, it I think it's quite interesting if you can see like a manual that can be applied in Europe, the manual that can apply in Asia, yeah. Uh, so because. As you know, we have different background, yeah, education background, different culture, yeah. Uh, so and different economy, yeah. So I think, I think it would be interesting if you can create uh, this um, manual uh, and then can be applied uh, based on the uh, certain region, yeah. Uh, so we can see uh, how can you develop, how to make those places more interesting, yeah, more attractive, yeah, and can generate more income to the local community, yeah. Uh, so I think uh, only that, yeah, uh, um, for me, yeah, for for your case, yeah. Okay, the rest is thank okay. you. Definitely is good. Okay. Yeah, thank you, Mary. Okay. Thank you, too. Okay, and next, uh, we want to uh, Vaclav. Vaclav, how are you? Hi. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, your project is about the, you are going to invent uh, the a system or a, a machine, a system or are you going oh, to sorry. invent? Are you going to invent uh, a machine or system in the future about this uh, food production? Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's actually like. Uh, if you are talking like that was the diploma project and I already like finished him and uh, mm -hmm. I only use some kind of research, but uh, mm -hmm. right now for me, I try to like to fix my research uh, in that uh, in that area as I choose this like little Oscar Pomeravi, this flat plain forest and uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, that's for me important to do research because uh, even I have a problem with uh, this diploma project that uh, with diploma project I have a problem that uh, the topic grows uh, into mm -hmm. enormous way. So, <laughs> it's... okay, I understand. Yeah, uh, I think um, your the impact of your research, here, your project will be good. Yeah? It will be huge impact to the world. Yeah. Uh, because it's dealing with this uh, the food production, yeah. Because the the increased demand, yeah, the increased demand, yeah, and then um, the industry become, how to say, not partially recovered from the pandemic, yeah. But but at least uh, partially recovered from the pandemic, but and then because of that, the industrial uh, would, how to say, in, uh, uh, ask for the increased demand for the food production. Yeah, so I think um, I think uh, your 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 research will be will be uh, will be will be good. Yeah, but I think uh, in one aspect maybe not focusing too much on the uh, high tech, yeah, high technology. Yeah, maybe you can use these uh, three things like water for production and energy, but in the conventional way. Yeah, because. Um, Maybe the same principle, but it can be applied in a conventional way, yeah. Uh, because uh, I'm not sure other region like in Africa, yeah, uh, in other uh, other places, uh, just lack of the technology, yeah. So like uh, they can, I'm not sure is it is it can can have the same technology, the one that you propose or not, yeah. So maybe you can uh, you in you can propose something like uh, your approach can be implemented in the conventional way too. Yeah, uh, not only the high tech, but in the conventional way. Yeah, so it can be applied in in two different way. Yeah, uh, so uh, that's uh, that's all. Yeah, <laughs> from my comment for you. Yeah, my glove. Yeah, good luck. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. All right. So okay, the last presenter. Katerina. Katerina? Yes, yes, I can hear you. Thank you. Okay. How are you? <laughs> I'm fine, thank you. <laughs> okay. Um about this um uh, okay, shooting cities. So 
I would like to ask you uh, about the, the future of these shrinking cities. So from your observations, from your readings, so what do you think the futures of these sh shrinking cities? Um, I think it's just a state which it cannot be uh, or it doesn't have to be uh, eternal. It doesn't have to be like it's shrinking forever. But the thing is that uh, the urban structure is changing and the movement of people is always uh, different, which means that maybe every city can be in a way sh uh, in one a shrinking city in part of its history. And it can be a stagnating city and can be a gr growing city. So um, I wouldn't say that the shrinking city is like the one um, state it can be in, but uh, the zoning plan or the plan how we um, mm -hmm. develop the cities should uh, focus on those three uh, things, how to, uh, which is stagnation, growing and shrinking, and not mm -hmm. just only on growing because mm -hmm. it can uh, people are moving all the time and the urban structure uh, mm -hmm. can't react as quickly to the problem mm, that's true that's true so how about the policy what do you think is there any policy that i know the you maybe you can create a new policy <laughs> guideline from your research uh policy uh, maybe uh try to explain again i don't understand the question the, that well. the, the policy from your research, maybe you can uh, create a new policy from your research? Maybe, maybe. That would yeah. be lovely. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. But uh, I think it's very hard to work with uh, municipalities or maybe it's mm. uh, easy to work with one, uh, with, with uh, some of them, but it's more, um, it's very complicated to have some kind of policy which would work on uh, all a level and also mm. Every city is a little bit different, so I don't know mm. if uh, it could be uh, like a state policy or it can mm. be something like a, um, maybe a manual or something which you can take, but you have to uh, make it a little bit different for each city which is using it, basically. Okay, all right. So, okay, that's all for me. Okay. Good luck, Katrina. Okay. Thank you. Okay, uh, did I wait? Uh, your comments from uh, uh, Katerina, thank you. Yeah, uh, hi, Katerina. Um, yeah, the aspect of uh, uh, studying uh, cities and uh, urban, I think, uh, uh, again, it's quite challenging uh, in the sense that um, there's a lot of uh, consideration, right? Factors that you have to consider. Uh, I think in your case, in talking about shrinking cities, declining of population and so forth, uh, uh, probably related to economic point of view, um, uh, political point of view as well, as well as uh, I, I probably my, my opinion is, is also the resources. The uh, when you have a lot of resources, you have uh, plenty of jobs, manufacturing and so forth. So that tends to uh, uh, and um, to, to make the cities uh, grow and so forth. Um, yeah, I think um, I'm I'm curious to know in terms of the outcome from your uh, previous studies on the urban wilderness. Um, I mean, uh, what was your findings and in, in your 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 final outcome out of that? Um, it wasn't part of this presentation because it went more into um, into the deep of the city structure of Wimberg, but. Uh, Basically, uh, I have found places which are abandoned somehow, and uh, I said like there are thirty place, places in the city of Wimberg which uh, are abandoned on some kind of level, and I created like a manual or a, a, like a, how would you call it? There was uh, all the levels of. Um, what you can do with these kind of places if for example this uh, the abandoned places in in a state which can be used for a uh, cultural action in a way that Marie for example was presenting or if it's uh, in a such a bad state that it's better for it to uh, be demolished and uh, give this space in the middle of the city uh, for a new function 
or there is uh, there were lots of houses in a, a private ownership and they were derelict but uh, there is no policy in Czech Republic which can basically take uh, the site or the building from your uh, private ownership if you don't um, if you don't take care about it, because there is no one who would uh, make, for example, a list of a buildings which are not being taken care of. So uh, I think there is like a big gap which is being uh, dealt with more in uh, other countries of Europe. For example, I think in Ireland, they have these kind of like lists, municipalities, have this list and they say like this building is abandoned for five years let's take it and we have to do something with it and uh, they can take it from the private ownership because they gave him a warning you have to do something with it but there are so, uh, there are many places in uh, Wimperk like that so uh, the outcome was basically a manual what type of uh, derelict site it is and how it can be used in the future from the city yeah yeah i think that that's very interesting in the sense that um uh, i mean we, i mean we can question in terms of uh, the role of architects uh that it's not just designing buildings and, and and building physical stuff but uh in terms of like you said uh, um how how uh, such an object could be owned owned by uh, a particular communities like uh, you see a lot of this commons movement in in europe like uh, the community took over certain areas, and 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 you have also like uh, for example in London uh, there's a firm called Zero Zero Architect that that they are not designing stuff but they are designing the the mechanism of of how a, a house could could be owned uh, uh, using certain uh, system or or, or tools um, or uh, that that deals with a lot, a lot of these policies is with all this. Uh, uh, immaterial stuff not 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 uh, like everything that leads to uh what do you call that uh, uh, the technicality of owning something or, or owning a building uh, i think and, and zoning as well i think that that's uh, an area that you could explore uh, uh towards um yeah I, I think that's all i have in terms of time uh, i think uh, thank uh, you. i want the best uh, in the phd thanks thank you very much Thank you. Uh, so uh, let's hear from, as I said, Dr. Uh, Prof. Uh, Dr. Cairo for comments. Thank you. Dr. Cairo, I think you are uh, mute. Katrina, yeah. Uh, another interesting uh, yes. uh, uh, proposal. Uh, but but at the moment, uh, you 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 are you are still within uh, uh, the. Um, a fact finding mission, aren't you? With regards yes. to this, uh, you you mm -hmm. find yeah you 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 find this what shrinkish the world in the shrinking world so interesting that that somehow you you uh, stamp it on your on your in in, in your premise of, of research, but that's okay. It's a, uh, it's 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 actually a, a phenomenon that is well described, I think, in the literature uh, and well studied, especially. Uh, in uh, uh, with planners and uh, architects who are interested in urban, you know, uh, and they they do they do deal in a, in a higher level of granularity, the higher level, meaning meaning that uh, it's on a bigger scale. So when you look at shrinkage, uh, it it does tends to actually associate with cities uh, on a big scale, you know. Uh, this, this is a scale issue, uh, and uh, very rarely, well. There, there are researchers and well-known uh, researchers uh, who actually undertake uh, uh, at, a, at, a, at a lower depth, you know, the, 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 of, of study. I mean, take for example, I'm sure you've heard of Jane Jacobs. Mm -hmm. The way that the way that she 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 actually describes the phenomenon, and she, by the way, she's not an architect or 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 a planner even. She's just a layman, a layperson who actually has a has a deep uh, has a has a has a direct feel of the place. Uh, then more than those sitting in the uh, higher echelon of powers, you know, policymakers, and so so she's like a kind of like a a, a kind of a litmus, litmus test for the layperson, you know, to actually tell policymakers, you know, what they what happens to them, you know, how they feel and what's actually really happening on the ground. So so I think I think uh, your research will 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 
will uh, probably dealt with initially at the higher level of granularity. Uh, whereas uh, perhaps maybe as a PhD, I think as you as time passes by, you would drop down into the more specific detail, you know, uh, and, and you probably have to explain, for example, maybe or maybe associate shrinkage with, for example, let's say gentrification. You know, uh, the reasons of why people, certain people displace other people. <laughs> you know? Uh, so it's, it's it may be that the, the the shrinkage may not happen. Well, it, it seems on 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 a higher level, it looks as though a three percent shrinkage has happened. But perhaps within a certain community, within a certain identifiable population, it hasn't happened. You know, perhaps uh, what happened on the on the on the lower level or the uh, on the final level of granularity, that certain section of the population is 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 ironically experiencing greater influx of people greater increase, whereas the overall population has suffered shrinkage. So you, you, you will find at the same time, you know, this is the paradox, uh, that, that you, you find some, uh, uh, you find the overall population shrinks and everybody just broods and unhappy, you know, puts an unhappy face. But actually, on certain section of the population within the same area, they're actually experiencing, uh, 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 you know, uh, growth. So, so you you have a, a countless of paradox happening at the same time in the same place. So you have to actually to be able you you should be able to tease out these issues. I think it's the issues that that probably will dictate the direction of where it's going. So shrinkage is 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 a is a variable that can be explained on the higher level, but really what it needs probably is actually a more detailed uh, uh, you know detailed explanation uh, levels of plausibility. That happens, you know, uh, not to the extent of causal causality, you know, it's, it's not, you're not, you're not trying to explain causes. It's just, just trying to link the phenomenon. And so you'd have many, many, uh, events happening at the same time that may be contradicting to each other. Hence you call a paradox or dichotomy, you know? So this, these are the things that probably will be very, very interesting to tackle the dichotomy or the paradox, you know, uh, things that happening, uh, the undercurrent that's happening, you know? So, so you, mm -hmm. you, 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 it'll be good actually to, to know because, because, uh, uh, I think if you were to go deeper into the, 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 the context of place, you'll find very surprising things, you know, uh, for example, like, uh, do, do children thrive in these areas that you call shrinkage areas, you know, so, so, uh, so, uh, doesn't that trigger you that the fact that, you know, how come, uh, shrinkage, which normally connotes some kind of depressing that depressing data but it actually actually comes out with uh, it conjures exciting things you know so 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 this phenomenon uh, this phenomenon might be something for you to actually investigate you know uh, it will be it will be very interesting to to deal with you know? uh, especially in the context of the area that you're dealing with you know uh, yeah i think that's that's lots of uh, of things to discuss i i'm afraid i'll be, I'll be cautioned along the way <laughs> All the time, you know, time wasting uh, efforts that that uh, you know uh, that, that I may take by the by the uh, uh, the MC. <laughs> anyway, but but I do I do I do think uh, I do see uh, good stuff coming out uh, 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 critically from your work uh, in in the future. You know, uh, maybe in the future we, we we probably might might actually discuss it further. In will be good. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. Thank you very much yeah. for your comment. I think I'm yes. just in the phase which I'm from the like a bigger point of view trying to find a way yes. how to access it for the smaller cases you're funneling then, yeah you're funneling into yeah. the final points yeah, of, yeah, yeah. yeah. and good. how to choose the right cities which yes. would be good to explore to see the phenomenon you're talking about yes. more mm -hmm. in a, in a particular case study yes thank you very much for yeah. the comment welcome you Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Cairo, for the comments. Okay, uh, without further ado, let's uh, uh, hear from uh, Thomas uh, T. Audi on his research, uh, exploring social cultural meaning and values for sustainable indigenous house transformations. So are you ready, Thomas? But if you're ready, the floor is yours. Okay, let me share my screen. It's Can you see my screen, please?
Hello? Okay, okay. Yes, we can. Okay. My name is um, Thomas Stena Audrey, and I'm presenting my work, uh, my study in progress titled Exploring Social Cultural Meanings and Values for Sustainable Indigenous Housing Transformation. Between people of Central Nigerian context. So transformation generally encompasses um, physical changes, additions, replacements, improvements, all gears, um, most of them often resulting in betterment of the infrastructure. In Nigeria, um, conventional mass housing without recourse to people's values often results to what researchers call uncomfortable prototypes. We are residents conduct a kind of unguarded transformation on their buildings. And for them, all scholars in Nigeria advocate a kind of transformative improvements of indigenous housing in line with sustainable development goals so as to mitigate the acute housing shortage in Nigeria. So the problem actually is that uh, Nigeria has massive housing shortage, which Richard has put uh, at over 20 million units, and uh, the growth is even keep growing all day, every year with 720,000 units. So stakeholders and the researchers um, recommend exploring indigenous alternatives to solve the massive shortage. And um, the research also found that uh, mass housing without recourse to the values of the people often results to, to change, uncomfortable progress and unguarded changes. So this study tried to fill the gap of uh, the need for value-based improvement strategies for the indigenous housing. And then also the means engine as the main methodological approach to this study has not uh, fully been used in the African context. Most of the study using utilizing mean engine are done in Europe and Asia. So in the African context, the uh, application of methodology is scarce. And then also the built environment of the key people in context uh, is not optimally explored due to the, uh, is, is visibly seen that uh, the scarcity of literature much in the area on that context too. So these are the gaps the study wants to fill. So in the, um, in the formation of the questions and objectives, the main uh, is to, to explore as stated the social means and values to sustainable improvement of the indigenous housing. And then the objectives at the mass one is to to identify, we first of all identify the meanings and the values that shape the house form of the people. And then from there, we go ahead and rank them. It's not all of them that are valid. The, the identification could be up to 100, but we rank the ones that are really valid. And then lastly, the objective is to evaluate them, to test them using uh, inferential statistics. So that will determine to predict their influence on the indigenous housing improvements in Nigeria. So this is just a research methodological flow from the background, the purpose of study, the literature you know, has three parts: the housing, about housing transformation, about the social and cultural theories in housing, and then the key people in context, all of them coming to methodology, and then using a mixed method, method of qualitative, quantitative. Um, using analysis to watch in vivo, 12, this is 22, and then finally the qualitative data with structure equation model, all to produce results and conclusions. So as part of the review, transformation generally has stated as about change, alteration, and in housing development, the change may occur either in private property, public housing, mass housing, or indigenous housing as determined by scholars. And the change could be spontaneous, it could be user-initiated or a planned neighborhood 
upgrade by government. And um, in the, the study of vernacular architecture or indigenous architecture, Barack Obama's has already worked on that and he concluded that there are two main aspects in the study of vernacular architecture, the physical aspects and the, so the social cultural aspects, all of them coming together to call what they, they term interdisciplinary approaches where anthropology, sociology, and the rest, architecture are all from under the interdisciplinary approach. So in, in studying the, the concrete uh, values in, in architecture, architectural processes, he recommends that uh, the, blended, the blended process, that is both physical and social culture um, process oriented should be combined for effective study of vernacular architecture. Other researchers also confirm that. So these are uh, the cultural and space relationships or the um, theories in culture and space. In the study of the relationship, my environmental relationship, that they define man, species, and culture, which they form cultural spaces. Um, there's a study of uh, space and culture forming cultural identity. There is a study of Rapopo um, study on house form, considering the physical factors, the social cultural factors, with some traces of economic factors in between them. And there is the emic and the ethic theory. The ethic theory, the observer view, which is the more objective uh, views obtained from literatures and other outsiders, and then the emic uh, approach, what are the people themselves saying? And then the reality is now at the middle. The literature, the what people are saying, and then you find the reality, some of the theories. So um, informing the, the framework, the conceptual framework for the study, um, the, the, the cultural housing theories we are used as a basis, the emic, the outsider view of the housing, and then the insider or what the people view the housing themselves, which um, can be received through the mean ancient theory to extract the values, the social cultural values of the people using also saving through the house form theory of Rapopo and the human environmental uh, relationship to at the end we find the sustainable indigenous transformation strategies. So in the in the main framework, you see the housing aspects of it, the built environment here. These are the, um, the, 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 the current issues, the problem, the gap, and the outcome here. So these housing are seen through the, the social and cultural theories in between them to attend to solve the problem of uh, well, uh, bringing sustainable transformation strategies. In the, the mean state chain theory, which is the main methodology of this uh, study, and there's a product, which in this case is a house, um, has a physical attribute or concrete attributes. And then these attributes have their functional utility, which is called the consequences. And then before you, you arrive at the values. So using the mean and chain theory and things that uh, you cannot just see a product and then you extract the values. It must go through the physical attributes, the consequences they use before the values. Okay. So this mean and chain is really um, applicable where the values are to be elicited, perceptions are to be sought from the people uh, using the methodological and systematic approach. So in this study, um, first, the mean and chain uh, theory was used to elicit uh, the values through interviews, and then the results were secondly used in a qualitative manner to, through the questionnaires, in the form of survey, to also elicit the values on a, in a bigger scale, so that to be able to generalize on a bigger scale. The two we combined to form the housing transformation strategies which is the premise of this study. So under review also is the people in context, the chief people of Central Nigeria. On their study, we have the, their history, 
the social, economic, and then their housing or architecture. These are the elements that are studied. And then their social cultural settings is also there. Their location in Africa, Nigeria, and Benue State. So these are their form of housing, indigenous housing, and that the people use uh, locally to house themselves. So the question that uh, needs to be asked is, what are the philosophies, the meanings, the values in this uh, type of housing, indigenous housing or the built environment that need to be explored and then harnessed for future, um, for future development, for sustainable development in the future. It's not, uh, even though the world is moving at the larger scale, we are the whole world is becoming a global village. Uh, there's also the theory of cultural sustainability that the culture of people should be maintained. So in doing that, we are trying to, in this case, extract the meanings and values here that can be blended together to form a modern architecture in the context of the two people of Central Nigeria. And in this study, particularly, um, the methodology involves um, a kind of uh, mixed method where qualitative study was first carried out in the form of uh, interviews. And then that one is followed by quantitative testing of the interview to in order to generate. So combining the two is what we call the mixed method under the different philosophies called constructivism, pragmatic approach, and, and the likes of them. So in another direction, using the Saunders uh, methodological research onion, um, the research also adopted the central theme of, uh, of the mixed method, which is called um, the exploratory sequential um, um, approach in this particular one. And then uh, in answering the research objective are the questions, first the observation, and then the interview, which is the mere chain interview called the soft lottery was the first stage, which is followed by the, um, the first one is called the, uh, um, the, the survey, which is the first part, uh, and then followed by another set of survey, which is a form of linker scale, a more qualitative, why this survey is categorical and, um, and uh, straightforward with analysis is of frequencies and highs. The more the one of linker scale will involve more inferential statistics in order to test the constructs. So the nominated uh, research design for this, and uh, these are the research questions, the research objectives, process, methodology for each of the phases are listed here. And then uh, in the first phase, which is the qualitative approach, um, 24 people, participants, we are interviewed in all, representing three area, local government areas of Benue State and the people. Um, the researchers recommended some thresholds, like for the case of uh, ethnography, uh, some researchers research that, uh, I mean, some researchers recommend that uh, between 20 to 40 participants is sufficient sufficient and the grounded theory which is uh, more of part of this research is about is stated that 20 people minimum of 20 is sufficient for for interview and then for the mean chain laundry which is some laundry interview they say at least 20 people so the choice of 24 participants has been justified using uh, the different research uh, approaches by people and then in the other aspect, the quantitative aspects, um, coming at uh, the final respondents of 350, which was physically carried out uh, last year in the study under review under the, the field work last year, we arrived at <coughs> Cochera using the, Choco, the Cochrane formula. Um, is, uh, we put it the target population of this for something representing the three area and the 40% of adults, because Nigerian population, more about 60% are youth below the age of 30. So if we had the population of this and then 40% of this, this is the target population. And then with that, using the Cochrane formula, we arrive at 800, 384 minimum sample. The Yamani 
the, the small higher which is 399 the kinetic ammonia is also any any population more than 75 percent will have a minimum of 384 and then for the structural equation measure which will later be used is generally for confirmation uh, factor analysis is between 30 to 460 based on the, the special context and the mean and chain hydrogen is 50. So this made, uh, this research decided to adopt 450 justifying history for robust uh, analysis, uh, analysis. And um, 200 questionnaires were sent to each of the areas and these are the numbers they have returned representing 80% of return, return rate. And um, the first um, throwback alpha representing the reliability uh, return 0 0.831, which is satisfactory without eliminating any of the construct. And there's possibility that some construct fall below that if they were eliminated, it will go much higher than this. But since it's fall be, uh, above the threshold, between six to one, zero point six to one. Um, at this point, satisfactory. So all the data was used. So in the qualitative aspects, um, first of all, the teams were formed using web clouds, using the um, Envivo twelve, and uh, they were also ranked using the, the, the number of links and a traditional presentation of uh, data. In mean and chain is what we call the hierarchical value map, representing the link of each of the housing attributes. The link that is coming to the top wall is what they call the value domain by Schwartz. And then these two values of instrumental and terminal value by Rukech. Uh, you know, in the past, mean and chain normally stop at the Rukech values, but in the 90s, Schwartz now developed. Uh, uh, what about the universe? Okay, we have another two more minutes to proceed the Poyoni. Thank you. Two more minutes. And then the significance was also tested for the results. We are most of the control and the question we are significant except for one, which is right here. And also for the consequences, only one question was insignificant. Also for the values, only one of them seemed to be insignificant. So lastly, the last part of it, um, which we involve uh, quantitative study, we involve the leakers scale, which is already online in Google form and it's already producing results. So with that now, um, the number of control, like in this model here is seven, and then the variables is nine, and then we come up with 200 respondents for the final phase of the the studies. So this, as area stated, this result, uh, this result adopt exploratory sequential mixed method comprising of qualitative study, quantitative, and then the link scale to order to come up with improvement strategies for, for, for this result. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ali, for your interesting uh, social cultural indigenous house transformation. So that's here. Uh, from our experts panel uh, to comment on your uh, thesis uh, research. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, shall we comment now or shall, uh, yeah. Yeah. shall we comment? comment now? No, I do, would you like to, uh, uh, oh, uh, we may proceed until uh, at the uh, presenter and then we'll comment okay okay we will, uh, uh, we will proceed with the second uh, second presenter which is uh, Nab uh, Miss Nabila Zainal Abidin uh, for a research title using the um, uh, tree modeling uh, identifying agronomic uh, for the traditional houses okay uh, you may proceed uh, Nabila okay I'm going to share my presentation can you see my slide 
Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, can you see? Can you see it now? Yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay, so my name is Nabila, and this is my title using 3D modeling program in identifying ergonomic properties of traditional Malay furniture of Malaysian architectural heritage. So basically, um, the aim of my research is to investigate the uh, ergonomic properties of the furniture used by the traditional Malays in order to help produce a standard of economics in Malaysia. Well, the objectives that I used, uh, the first one was to calculate the anthropometric measurements of the traditional Malays to determine the ergonomic properties of the traditional Malay furniture used inside a traditional Malay house and to produce a data set that can help in the process of designing a new standard of economics for furniture that can be used in both modern and traditional homes in Malaysia. So basically a brief look at the research gap. A lot of studies on furniture has uh, been done on Western furniture and uh, mostly the ones that focus on the Asian furniture are usually from China or Japan or India. And most uh, of these studies, many of them only look at the visuals, at how the furniture looks. And not many, not much of them are uh, pertaining to dimensions and how the furniture interacts with the users. So that is where my research will be looking into. It's more towards human interaction of uh, furniture. So basically the main problem uh, that this research arises was because uh, Malaysia actually, we don't have our own standard of ergonomic. We the current one that we use is actually an identical copy of the international standard, which is basically based on the UK proportion of users. So we know that Western and Asian users don't have the same body proportions. So if we look into furniture, we know it's an important part of civilization whether in the past, present or future. And furniture has four main purposes. So furniture as function, furniture which confers to status, furniture as technology, and furniture as an exhibition. So as a personal statement about who made it and who it belongs to. So basically, uh, traditional Malay furniture are categorized into three which is body supporting, storage, and for tool. So um, basically the definition of furniture that is used uh, in this study, in my research, is uh, an equipment used by the people in their daily lives, whether for storage, utility, or as a tool, characterized by their functions, usage, and types, that are available both externally and internally of a traditional Malay house. So basically, uh, what's special about the traditional Malay furniture is that they have uh, within the built-in category, they are separated into two subcategories, which are architectural elements and furniture by default. So the furniture that are the architectural elements, they were built and designed as part of the house, but used as furniture due to culture of the traditional Malays. So basically like the stairs or the window railings, they, they are used as a body supporting unit. The second subcategory is furniture by default. So they were built and designed as furniture. So these are like shelving, for storage, for beds and cushions and mats. So, 
So uh, basically to look into how furniture are ergonomic or not, it pertains to human factors. So you have to look into the uh, ergonomic assessments, which are ergonomic risk assessment and physical demand assessment. So these are the two factors that are looked into to determine whether the furniture are, is uh, considered as ergonomic or not. So uh, one more, another a category or another factor that I look into is the range of movement or range of motion of the user while they are interacting with the furniture or with the uh, equipment in the environment. So based on this study, the range of motion, there are four different types of uh, ranges. Uh, we can see it clearly in here. So the green zone, uh, is the one where the user is stationary and then if there are any slight movements it goes into the yellow zone and towards a uh, high movement or high range it goes into red and beyond red zone so if it goes into beyond the red zone the furniture or uh, equipment is considered less ergonomic because it harms the user while in the long run. So basically, uh, what I had to have on hand was a standard anthropological data of the traditional Malays. And this is, uh, I took from a previous study, which, uh, is the template used and also is combined with the one used by Bifma. This one is, uh, I think as an architect, I think we all know this uh, design where if you are saying universal design and this is from Bifma. So basically I calculated both of them to make uh, a new standard that I use for this study. So in order to recreate into a 3D model that uses the appropriate uh, anthropometric measurements of the traditional Malays. Because uh, we're dealing with uh, um, heritage and old structures. Most of the uh, buildings aren't there anymore. So we rely heavily on archived reports and from detailed measured drawings that are reported inside uh, one of our centers. So based on the reports, I collected uh, the oldest houses from each state of Malaysia and from the drawings uh, and the reports, I identified where the areas that had the furniture and were what kind of activities that the users carried out inside the spaces. So all the furnitures were identified and the measure drawing were recreated into a 3D design because uh, in order to look into the ergonomic properties, uh, everything had to be made virtually. So a recreation of the houses, of the models, and of the activities were made in 3D. So these are all a few examples of the activities or of the spaces and to look at the volumes and the activities that are carried out inside the spaces. So when the 3D models are cre recreated, you can tell uh, how the structure or how the furniture interact with the 
user. So this was a rough uh, animation of the interaction between the structures and the users. So this was a Paddy Smasher, one of the furniture used in harvesting paddies. So this, uh, these are all the recreated activities of uh, inside each of the spaces of the houses that were chosen as samples. So from this, after the activity, after the recreation has been done, each spaces and each activities were listed down. So in order to have a visual representation of the activities and also the furniture used in the spaces. So uh, how I analyze the ergonomic properties is to look first to look at the range of movement. So this is uh, one example of the analysis of range of movement. So from this, uh, the findings concluded that the traditional malaise have a higher flexibility, which increases their range of movements. So we can't actually use the definition or the four ranges stated previously because uh, studies already state that uh, the traditional malaise are more flexible. So their beyond red zone might be more than what the Westerners can perform. So these are a few more examples of the range of movements. On the next uh, analysis was to carry out a rapid entire body assessment. This assessment allows, uh, allows us to calculate the weight and the, how, how long the user carries out the activity in order to provide a score, a REBA score. So the higher the score, the more unergonomic the furniture is. So the best REBA score would be to have a two to three score. Uh, so this would indicate that the furniture is ergonomic. So this, I'll show you one of the example of how the calculate, of how the ergonomic properties were calculated based on the REBA uh, analysis. So this was a, uh, the score had a two to three, which shows that it's low risk and change may be needed, but it's not immediately uh, needed. So basically, based, uh, more, most of the scores of the traditional Malay furniture, they had the scores uh, pretty low, and which indicates that most of these furnitures were ergonomic. So once we know that these furniture were ergonomic, uh, we can uh, use their properties or, pro or produce um, new furniture uh, that, uh, that uses uh, the data set from these scores. So basically, because as I stated earlier, Malaysia doesn't have our own standard of ergonomics. Uh, most of our furniture companies, we produce many furniture that are a lot of sizes. We don't have a standard. So uh, there's a lot of mismatch be between the user and the furniture. So this isn't something that is good because mismatch in furniture, it uh, decreases productivity, it 
it increases musculoskeletal disorders inside uh, between in all the users. So it affects our health in the long run. So uh, my study was uh, is to produce a data set. So from this data set is uh, it can be used in order to produce a new standard of ergonomics that can be used in the production of uh, furniture in Malaysia. So that's it. Okay, uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Nabila. Uh, fascinating research on uh, anthropologic for agronomic traditional Malay furniture. Okay, uh, so let's uh, listen to our last presenter by uh, Masa uh, Tati B uh, on research uh, towards the value driven uh, framework for build, uh, built environment sustainability. So, uh, um, the virtual floor is yours, uh, Ms. Masa. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm just sharing my slides. Okay. So. All right. Uh, Bismillah ar rahim uh, My uh, topic is critical design development of sustainable neighborhoods. And uh, my name is Masa Khatibi, and I just finished my fourth uh, semester. So I just began my fifth semester. Um, so let's begin. This is what I'm going to be presenting from introduction to a little bit of literature review and the articles that um, I would be publishing or considered for publication and then the discussion and conclusion. Just to make clear that uh, my uh, presentation or my PhD would be a PhD by publication, so it's not a conventional uh, PhD, it's by publications. So. When I always talk about sustainability and when I talk about my PhD idea, the first question that comes into mind and people ask me that what is sustainability? Sustainability is something that nobody has defined and yet it's true because um, there are very different versions of sustainability and sustainable development. But um, to narrow it down and for my purpose in this study, um, the first important um, study was Brunton Report, and now the 17 SDGs, which have a definition of sustainable development, and um, especially the SDG 11, which is the sustainable cities and uh, communities. So this is going to be my interest of sustainability. And uh, of course, uh, SDGs also uh, consider um, sustainable cities and societies and then built environment, of course, is going to be very important. But to design, it's important to have an assessment because without assessment, it won't be possible to design. So assessment is a key part. So if I have to conclude my whole PhD revolves around this idea of sustainability and sustainable development, built environment and its assessment. So, uh, to give a background of uh, initial thoughts, I, I have looked into the design disciplines because design, we call everything a design, but there are researchers or design uh, researchers who have de defined design as a discipline and they call it, they have uh, introduced particular attributes of design and if I have to really, um, you know, um, conclude it, or make it short, I would say design has to be empathetic to human condition. It has to have systematic contribution. And of course, it should be unique and context dependent. So in case of sustainability also, um, the systematic contribution of sustainability has to be considered. Sustainability cannot be defined as one thing in one country and the same thing in other. It should be different in different areas. It should consider human values. And also there are researchers who are trying to find out that how um, design can support sustainability. And this is the state of the art. They have now agreed that 
um, technologies on their own cannot provide sustainability. People have to be involved. There have to be integrated solutions and um, ideas have to be systematic. There are yet uh, challenges of integrated sustainability because when we talk about sustainability, there are multiple dimensions to it. There's environmental, social, economic. So uh, even an affordable house, we can call it sustainable, but it might not be because the social issue uh, might uh, prove it. Otherwise, the time which is sustainable now might not be sustainable at another point, like in terms of heritage, maybe there needs to be additions. The scale, um, for, for example, in a building, if we put a lot of HVAC systems, we call energy efficient HVAC systems, we call it sustainable, but at the larger scale, the transportation, the energy for its production, the products might make it unsustainable. And then the multiple interpretation, as I said earlier, because for different context, sustainability could be different. For example, if I have to say in Europe, uh, maybe uh, sustainability would be a matter of natural resources and pollution, but in Afghanistan, maybe it's because of like um, the war, because you cannot protect the environment without giving people peace and rest. So there are limitations also to literature, which then uh, evolves into my study and my publications. Uh, the first is that there's growing body of knowledge and only 600 building assessment systems uh, defining sustainability in buildings, but yet a lot of criticism on it because uh, many um, architects, designers say that uh, they do not um, define sustainability well and um, there are also a lot of reports on inequalities because they say that the sustainable buildings and uh, sustainable developments have caused inequalities in wealthier nations and neighborhoods and in low income neighborhoods. And of course, the diverse models of sustainability, where some say that uh, there are three equal dimensions, and others say that no, the dimensions of environment, economy, and society cannot be equal. Uh, one has to be a broader dimension. For example, in the second case, we can say that um, society is a subset of environment. So people have to collaborate all together to protect the environment. So there are different theories of how it can work. If I have to divide my problem statement into three parts, the first would be the specific problems that I want to underpin here. In any case, whatever sustainability is, we know that SDG 11 requires sustainable cities and societies, and there's a lot of population growth and a lot of built, in, built environment built. So, and a lot of criticism on the definition of sustainability and the sustainable built environment, especially the fact that they are, they have an environmental perspective. Secondly, is the impact of the problem, what, what it causes. The, the thing is that people say that if we only consider environment and we built, uh, built environments that do not consider the social and economic outcomes and their interrelationships, then the problem is that we're consuming even more resources, more, more costs, and a lot of inequalities. So, here, the proposal is to explore the design based and socially driven. It's not social sustainability assessment, but socially driven approaches to enhance sustainable built environment assessment. And uh, more specifically, to explore the potential of um, spatial assessment to enhance neighborhood sustainability assessment. And I'll um, explain how I get to this specific because um, through the publications, the last one is this one. Um, social, the research gap is, of course, social sustainability has been avoided, I would say, most of the times. And even in the neighborhood assess, uh, sustainable assessment, this, uh, neighborhood assessment systems, this, this has been avoided for a long time. Urban form, although, has a very uh, important uh, impact on uh, sustainability, but it has not many uh, assessment systems have considered it, and especially spatial uh, assessment has not been considered. And moreover, space syntax, which is a social spatial analysis tool, 
uh, its impact or how it can support the assessment of sustainability in neighborhoods has not been tackled before. So this is the very specific focus that um, would be, inshallah, my last publication. So, if I have to define the research aim, it is to explore the impact of design driven socially dominated initiatives on improving sustainable built environment assessment by studying the role of spatial assessment, particularly space syntax, which is a social spatial tool on enhancing the sustainable neighborhood assessment. So, there are 4 questions and, of course, objectives that has um, led to. The studies, the 1st, 1, and of, uh, each 1 of them is in form of a paper, which is either published or in the process of publication. The 1st, 1 is to examine the built environment uh, sustainability assessment methods and their limitations, because there has been a lot of criticism about them. The 2nd, 1 is to tackle the design discipline and um, see how design can provide new conceptions or better ideas. The 3rd 1 is to. Um, based on the findings of the second one, I realized that maybe neighborhood assessment is better than building assessment in case of um, creating sustainable built environments. So then what are the design uh, driven factors of uh, neighborhood assessment? And then finally, based on the findings of the third one, I realized that urban form is very important. A lot of researchers emphasizing on it. So maybe it's a. Uh, good to consider spatial assessment because it has not been considered in the prominent NSA tools or neighborhood sustainability assessment tools, or maybe it's important to see how spatial assessment, particularly space and text techniques can enhance the neighborhood sus sustainability assessment tools and methods. So, as I said, it's um, four uh, papers for objectives. The first one is sustainable building assessment, and the findings is that there are a lot. There is a lot of environmental emphasis on that. The second one is that how design can help. What are the design-driven concepts? And then it was found that human involvement and participation is very important, which led to assessment of neighborhoods as a um, as an appropriate scale for determining sustainable built environment. And then uh, through the research, I realized that sustainable urban form and morphology can be very important. And of course, it led to a uh, spatial assessment of sustainability um, to see how spatial assessment can enhance neighborhood sustainability assessment. So these are the four papers. Um, the, the four papers are actually because there are four papers, each paper has its own objectives and there are different methods for each paper. The first uh, paper is on the right and there is um, a triangle that describes it. The first one is a case study. The second one is the comparative and thematic review paper. The third one is a systematic literature review and the fourth one is uh, the bibliometric literature review. So I started with building assessment and then how design can help to yeah, uh, uh, better so ideas of built environment and assessment. Two more minutes. Yeah, uh, we have about another two more minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay, thank you. The neighborhood assessment and then a special assessment. So the whole idea is that in terms of the sustainable models, we have socially dominant in terms of the assessment of built environment, neighborhood assessment, and in terms of the a particular area of interest is a spatial assessment. So these are the articles as I described earlier. It's, um, it's the same. The first one is that I studied the lead, which was my first objective. The lead, I uh, studied the lead building in Afghanistan and how it has a lot of environmental emphasis. With findings, and this paper is already published. The second article is uh, about uh, the conceptions of design and how people who have criticized what they have actually proposed. So this is actually reviewing their ideas. There are five authors that have considered their studies, Raymond Cole, Brickland, it's in the list, you can see, and this is their criticism and the ideas that they have uh, developed. And, and this leads to my conclusion that we have to shift to human-oriented systematic approaches. And 
so I won't go because I don't have enough time. So I'll just skip it. This paper is also published. And the third one, this paper is um, actually at the submission stage where I'm uncovering the formative concepts, shaping assessment of neighborhoods. So in this one, I'm using a systematic re uh, review, thematic analysis, 64 general articles, and then I uh, uh, categorized or um, calculated the ca criteria and then categorized them into factors. And I realized that uh, these are the important factors, sense of place, community, form and morphology, livability, equity, and viability. And, and of course, uh, all other factors were very much connected to urban form and morphology. So I found through these studies that it's very important. So this led to the other one that spatial assessment could be a very good contribution to neighborhood sustainability assessment to improve them and speci specifically studying space and text, and I would do, inshallah, a bibliometric review on that. These are the expected outcomes. Of course, the first one defines the limitations. The second research questions define the design-driven conceptions. The third one, design-driven factors of neighborhood assessment. The fourth one, how spatial assessment could maybe improve neighborhood sustainability assessment, and of course, it would lead to and um, these are the contributions because of uh, the lack of time. I'm not going to go into it. it the, the, I think there would be some empirical contributions in terms of methodology. I'm using four different types of review, which could be uh, in a in particular in, in one case, or maybe this is another contribution. And then the theoretically, I'm uh, trying to study if the spatial assessment can enhance neighborhood sustainability assessments. And of course, these are the publications and that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ms. Massa, and uh, facilitating on the publications and uh, built uh, environment sustainability. Okay, uh, let's hear uh, comments from our experts panel. Uh, yeah, thank you. So, uh, uh, um, maybe we can start from uh, uh, begin with uh, 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 engineer architect Dr. Uh, Ian, who led to go first, and then uh, uh, Dr. Giri, and then after that, uh, Dr. Reddy Thoman. Is it okay? Actually, uh, Yiri, uh, is it you who wants to start or shall I start? Who starts? Yeah, it's okay. Maybe uh, Dr. Yen wants to start first. Okay. Uh, okay, so start. let's start with Aula, with the first one. Aula, is that right? Am I saying that right? I don't want to mispronounce your name, so Aula. Okay. Uh, maybe I, I would start with the question. Uh, Aula, is your background? Uh, uh, what is your background? Are you architect? Are you educated as an architect? Yes, yes. Thank yes. You. Perfect. Okay. So I guess all of you are architects in a way. Mm -hmm. So, uh, okay. Th thank you. Thank you for the presentation. I mean, uh, Uh, I'll try to talk. Or I'll try to. I'll try to approach it from the perspective of maybe my country because we have a huge um, experience with mass housing, with uh, how to build uh, many many flats, you know, through the state-run like uh, enterprise, basically. And I think that that, that there is a good intuition. Or I think it's it's like crucial intuition that it is not only a technical problem how to build how to build uh, you know many housing units let's say, but also maybe a sociological or maybe even like anthropological problem because of course the problem of of these uh, shanty towns or slums or how how would, how would I call them. It's not only a technical problem, and I think this intuition is crucial. 
Uh, but uh, another thing is how to how to approach this uh, this intuition and how to uh, how to tackle it, you know, at the beginning with which methods and so on. Uh, so we have we have this modernist experience, right? That that the modernism was in a way good. Uh, it found it found a good like or at least successful strategies how to produce a certain standard of housing. Or this is at least my experience uh, in, in my country that the modernism was good in developing strategies how to produce a lot of uh, a lot a lot of uh, flats simply. And uh, for example, I have experience also from Turkey, where they are still using these modernist methods, really like building concrete slabs to house uh, newcomers and actually also to redevelop uh, informal settlements around, uh, for example, Ankara and Istanbul. So they are really like redeveloping them with this with this uh, uh, massive uh, uh, modernist like towers. And housing uh, people who were formerly housed in the in the informal settlements to these uh, to these uh, to these towers, and it, it really brings a social like issues and so on. And you can see that people are having really different lifestyles, you know, that are uh, that are rehoused from the from the informal settlements to these uh, to these uh, uh, to these uh, concrete like slabs and so on. So there, there is really this this uh, mismatch between this like technocratist. A point of view, which is successful in developing the housing, to to provide a housing, and with the lifestyle of the of the people that should be housed, and I think it's it's an interesting uh, it's it, it's it, it's interesting I issue because okay we have strategies how to develop a housing you know, but maybe <laughs> there are also other things to 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 look at. But I, I'm not sure if we can do it like without, not only through like a theories, like try to try to find the appropriate theories, but also to really like almost empirically look at the place what is going on there. So I, I, I'm not sure if, if this is uh, only like a theoretical issue that we can you know only go through the literature and try to find a solution in the literature but what i missed in the presentation was really like the experience from the settlements uh, themselves so i think this could tell us and if if you if you have a like um, if you can if you can go there if you have a chance to go there and if you are if you uh, if your origin is from uh, from the Tiff, I'm, I'm, I'm saying that right from, from the from the uh, uh, from Africa. If you are in a way, if you have access to the to the to the informal settlements, it would be really interesting to to have this experience. I guess that there was this like uh, there was this uh, like structured interviews with the people, and this this was interviews from the settlements. From the in, uh, you know what, what was the uh, what was the uh, uh, like what what was the aim what, what was your aim to use the the structured interviews what what were you expecting to get from them what was the questions that you want to get get answered by the interviews by the forms that the people should answer okay thank you very much you know um First of all, you know, I, I say this is um, the first stage of the interview, which um, the final aim was to get the values, the values and the meanings inherent in this um, their built environments. Okay, so the aim was actually the values, but uh, you cannot, as I say, cannot just ask them okay, what are the values in this the structure the systematic uh, way of doing it was the use of a theory called the means and chain so means and chain is about um, eliciting values through the physical the concrete the physical things you can see the physical products you can mm -hmm. see and then after that you ask them about okay the, the the physical environment, they can see it. 
You see, how can you describe the shape of the house? Mm -hmm. okay, the shape is round, it's rectangular. These are the answers. Okay, so what is it round? Why is it round? Why is it circular? Why is it rectangular? So they prefer the answer is because of uh, this, is because of their culture, is because of their history, mm -hmm. it's because of movement, it's because of communalism. Then from there, you see, what what is the values derived from this? So you can see these values are they can be inherently linked together with the attributes, attributes and the use. Uh -huh. And unless it was to extract the values through uh -huh. the functional. Yeah, this is what I got. But the ultimate goal is not only to like, like to describe the phenomenon, but to find mechanisms, maybe how to provide a better housing for the people. Right? Is this the aim? Is it aim to, to? Okay, first we have to describe what's going on, maybe what is the problem. But the ultimate goal is to find a mechanisms how to provide better housing. Yes. Or not? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. Okay, so okay, so, so thank you. So maybe you know, if if I should give a, a recommendation, I would look at the mechanisms that already exist that are able to provide a housing in a way, and then maybe to 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 maybe um, you know understand them, and then maybe to see what are the problems or if there are if they are usable, maybe in some cases and some cases not, and so on. And then maybe try to modify them, develop your own, and so on. But I think it it would be worth to worth to look at the mechanisms that have been used in the past to develop a how uh, develop a housing. And there are several ways. There are like these big big scales mechanism how to develop a housing. There are more uh, mechanisms to connect it to really informal settlements. For example, also in Europe here in Vienna, there have been informal settlements in the past that have been even tackled by architects, you know, that have been uh, in a way, um, uh, it was partly informal and partly they, they've tried to, to, to manage it somehow and so on. And there, there are, uh, yeah, I can think of, uh, there are also even like market driven, uh, driven uh, mechanisms, how to provide a, like low cost housing in a way. There are more like state, state, uh, focused like like state focused mechanism that the state is more involved in that and so on and maybe i would try to look at these mechanisms what they produce and maybe why they are not or maybe what why they might be or why they might not be usable in in those cases you know i'm i'm really not uh, i cannot somehow i I'm, for, for, it, it is for me too difficult to read the culture of your country you know, so I, I I think it is extremely important important uh, point that you have to look at it, but I think there are also some technical mechanisms that might be like studied. You know that there are there has been done in in, in modernist uh, you know era there has been done enormous amount of work how to provide a lot of housing and people have been thinking about that. So maybe I I would look at it, and these are problematic like. Uh, things and issues and so on, but I would look at it because many people has thought about it before. So maybe this might be my recommendation. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Uh, sorry, it was maybe too long. Okay, then... Uh... Then the ergonometry and 3D modeling. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, I think it was uh, like well structured presentation that I understood well what 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 is your like goal. I mean to provide a certain normative uh, you know set of rules how to how to design a, a furniture. Again, maybe I, I would. Uh, my suggestion would be, you know, to be short, uh, my suggestion would be to look at the history of ergonometrics because 
I think it is it is uh, also crucial to your enterprise because it would also give you some critical uh, distance, you know, from from what what you are trying to achieve because. Uh, the the ergonomics ergonometrics in in its own terms is really problematic so it's not only a problem of maybe that uh, different races and cultures you know that maybe the the, the bodies of of asian people are uh, differently shaped than of europeans but actually there is uh, there is also uh, the, the the ergonometrics in itself was connected to, or the invention of ergonometrics as we know it nowadays was connected to to uh, to uh, industrial production. That we need to produce, you know, industrial uh, things in in like uh, systematized and uh, typologized manner and so on. So then you need some system how to how to measure it, produce it, and so on. And it was also connected actually to factory environment it uh, you know it started as a scientific management of work how to how to efficiently connect people and machines and their environments and so on so it is entirely connected to to the idea of of uh, of ergonometrics was originally connected really to the problem of industry and the human and the uh, connection of the human and the environment and and how to how to produce the environment basically in industrial terms and therefore i think it's it's really interesting to to look at the ergonometrics through traditional through, through traditional structures <laughs> you know because uh, because maybe it can tell us something about the ergonomet ergonometrics than itself because in in, in pre industry in in the era before industrialism, it's it's a really different matter. I think that the, the, the ergonometrics wasn't that necessary in a way, or it, it at least as far as I know, it even didn't exist in itself. So I think it's interesting to look how the how maybe the structures were organized in some systematized fashion, and also how the environment was produced and so on. And so I think it could be like a, a critical moment when the uh, when vernacular structures and things can tell us something about the ergonometri ergonometrics itself as a science or as a thing. So I, I think this is a really interesting connection that is that can give us critical approach to ergonometrics maybe. And I think there is some potential that I that that wasn't like tackled enough for me. So this is the second one. And the third one was uh, third one was uh, sustainability, sustainability. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, I, I, I like the basic idea that we should look more at at least from the Western point of view. It is a good idea to look at the social sustainability because here and also at the schools of architecture, the sustainability is often understood as simply you know technological issue that we can find the technological patches for the for the. Uh, for the uh, pro problem of climate and environment, you know that we that we invest into the uh, into um, I don't know wind uh, power mills and uh, and, uh, and into into solar like uh, panels and so on, and that uh, this means the sustainability. You know that if we if we uh, put uh, solar panels on our roofs, that uh, this is what what uh, makes our houses and cities maybe sustainable. And this is like mainstream approach that it is a technological problem, and of course to to look also for the other domains that I think are relatively well established but may be not taken seriously enough at least by disciplines like architects. Then it is a, of course good uh, critical point. But uh, yeah, so uh, then I, I would need to see then a little bit like more concrete examples. I think maybe the, the recommendation would be then to 
yeah, I really go with the, with the case studies. It was there. I, I, I understand there was a text about the case studies, but I would like to see, you know, I would need more time maybe to study what you studied, to see the case studies and what was the, what was the, um, what was the output or your, uh, or the results of this, of this research. This I would, what I would be interested in. So maybe next time I would like to, I would be happy if I can see the, the case studies, it would be perfect. So, sorry, it was maybe too long. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you so much, Ian. Is Shahiria here? Then if not, we can move on to the um, next uh, panel. Do you have any comment? Maybe um, Radek? Or maybe you can go to Piri if you have any anything you want to add on? Uh, I would uh, like to start maybe because uh, I'm teaching very soon and I will have to leave, unfortunately. Um, is it okay with you, Radek? Okay, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> so thank you very much for inviting me to your um, or to, to our uh, first uh, joint uh, meeting uh, of minds. And uh, I appreciate that there are so many uh, of your students. Uh, and um, present today and uh, I was glad to uh, hear your uh, uh, comments on the um, on the sort of first uh, um, first steps in uh, the research of our uh, students or maybe uh, also sort of um, um, presenting uh, their uh, the outcome of their either a, a, a diploma or some uh, extensive uh, uh, already extensive uh, database, perhaps, uh, of uh, of examples uh, to you, <clears throat> and uh, and um, so um, let me just uh, briefly comment on to, on the three uh, panel uh, presenters today. <clears throat> um, I I do appreciate the um, the the topics that they have chosen, and I think uh, uh, they are. Um, uh, they have a potential. They um, are inspiring. Uh, um, they offer um, a possibility of uh, uh, critique or doubt, or um, or skepticism, which uh, is something what we're looking at uh, in, in science. Uh, they also uh, seem to be based in uh, literature, uh, um, especially the, the first one, um, the first uh, presenter. Uh, Tom Aule, um, uh, there, the, I must say the topic isn't really close to my heart uh, in terms of uh, how it was approached. Uh, although uh, I was uh, I was hoping that uh, the topic would be uh, a little bit more um, specific to um, to the um, the, um, the to the um, you know to the to the heart of the author. Which I, um, the indigenous uh, indigenous housing, uh, which means, uh, uh, in, a, in which we could be translated to to our environment here, could be the vernacular architecture, is something uh, that we have, um, or some of our some of our professors have studied also, in terms of geometry, in terms of uh, um, <clears throat> the practicality of uh, things, how. Things were ventilated. What, how the floors were made, uh, how the facades were painted uh, in a very unique way, and um, and also documented those because they they are prone to disappear because they're made of um, materials that don't last long, and uh, you know they're threatened by the environment very much, and also threatened by the production of. Uh, Contemporary housing and uh, etc. So, um, which um, so I in in a, that could be a general comment to the three uh, to the three students. Uh, uh, maybe uh, which uh, what what our students uh, have presented were um, sort of ways uh, or proposals for practical solutions, which could be practical and beneficial to our society. So I would uh, 
recommend uh, thinking and maybe passing or changing, tweaking the questions, the search questions in the more sort of a practical way. How could that research, particular research could uh, contribute to the well-being of society, people, etc. Not just bringing uh, the a new body of knowledge to, to the research area. Um, <clears throat> then uh, the second, uh, Nabila, uh, I have already uh, I have already um, uh, posted or sent her some links to literature, uh, which uh, I found uh, useful and uh, in our um, department of uh, um, spatial design. Uh, my, some of my colleagues are uh, in sort of dealing with furniture design and uh, um, we we have uh, found these uh, books uh, quite useful on furniture, the Human Scale Manual. Uh, it's it's a really practical tool that you uh, can use, uh, um, like uh, like um, Honza, Jan Kristek has uh, said uh, um, that uh, the ergonomy um, measurements and uh, of body parts uh, of uh, the the furniture, the tools, the um, that we use. Uh, as people in general um, are um, studied for uh, for centuries, and uh, um, and then today we nowadays we have really uh, elaborate elaborate uh, uh, elaborate tools that uh, allows us allow us to uh, uh, to uh, get the right measurements, get the right advice, where uh, where um, um, not only uh, measuring physical objects but also positioning and uh, uh, and designing physical objects so so the um, and, and not only just uh, human in or people in general but also children and uh, some of these books that i recommended they they also look at the uh, children uh, uh, anthropometry uh, anthropometrics which um, I found interesting. So, uh, in, again, uh, being practical, I mean, I would be interested to uh, to know uh, what particular or what what exact benefit do you get from using the three D modeling? Uh, is I mean, what why is that uh, uh, special? And uh, but I do understand that uh, you you have reasons to to do uh, to do that kind of research uh, in in uh, Malaysia, and uh, and uh, as opposed to sort of uh, uh, taking over uh, some uh, recommendations uh, from other countries. But for example, the human scale manual is very universal. We can pretty much. Uh, um, by physically moving the or rotating these circles, you can adjust the the, the, the dimensions of, of the and the proportions of body body parts and uh, to, in order to get the right right uh, answer to to your design problems. Um, and also, it, it is it is a topic that talks about craft in a way. It's not just uh, I don't think it's just about measuring uh, as such as, as sort of a industrial uh, measurements, but also uh, on on the craft because you you mentioned and you started with uh, sort of naming the the different uses of uh, uh, different uh, types of furniture, uh, not uh, that and and um, and I think uh, in the traditional uh, sense. Uh, craft is something which we try to learn from, and uh, as as opposed to the the industrial solutions uh, that come with uh, the different types of materials that we're using now, uh, etc. So maybe the historical view and and the, and the would also be beneficial in in that sense. And then the last uh, one um, again, this is uh, something uh, I'm. What try? What was it? What I found interesting was that in the end, on the last slide, you mentioned space syntax, and uh, that was something I could uh, relate to. Um, we we um, had a student here, a PhD student who uh, finished his uh, thesis on uh, space syntax uh, uh, in relationship to the you know the spatial. Um, 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 
just you know um, in relationship to how we perceive how humans uh, move around cities uh, in terms of visual uh, evaluation of space um, and uh, how that could be sort of modeled and uh, um, and studied using the software uh, tools as, as say space in ducks and others um, so um, which uh, um, uh, is difficult for me to connect to social uh, aspect or social, social social dimension of your research in terms of uh, how you try to um, evaluate uh, sustainability. Uh, sustainability, we usually talk about three different pillars, the economy, ecology, and, uh, and, uh, 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 and, 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 and the social pillar, yes, uh, thank you. And, um, and, 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 and there I have a problem with space index. I, I cannot imagine uh, that tool being used for, uh, for, for social uh, measurement. So, um, which could be something you can, um, um, you can look at perhaps um, how, um, how, can, how, how your research could benefit or, or contribute to, um, to uh, perhaps a list, maybe you can list a number of, of uh, sustainability problems, issues, which are close to, uh, to your country, to your city, or, uh, you know, um, for example, um, I was looking into the topic of garbage cities and uh, the problem of waste uh, get generated by, by contemporary cities. Um, and the problem of incinera incineration and not really uh, being a safe uh, technology for, uh, you know, for getting rid of uh, waste or, or, um, or putting it in a landfill being another harsh and, uh, and uh, unsustainable means, uh, but which is uh, used in all countries. May what main, and, and, and in some countries really generating and contributing to the global um uh you know just open devastation global devastation of earth and uh, and so perhaps maybe uh, also when you list these environmental or or sustainability issues you can also rank them and perhaps focus on one which you would like to contribute to thank you Okay, thank you. Let's uh, hear from uh, uh, Dr. Reddick. Comments? Yes, uh, I will have, uh, yeah, I think I will have some, uh, yeah, I have comments and recommendations for Tom and uh, Massa. The, also the last presenter, I think I, I will have some, the, I, I can, in my comments, I can find some sim similarities because uh, for me, this uh, social, yeah, like uh, Tom's, uh, Tom's uh, work is uh, somehow based on the, the conflict uh, of uh, traditional settlements and traditional culture of uh, his, uh, his uh, country and the modernist uh, modernist uh, buildings, modernist block of flats, and these things uh, that uh, that this uh, that that usually these uh, these buildings, which are built uh, all over the world and they are almost uh, same all over the world, this uh, this, uh, uh, this this housing this modernist housing production it that doesn't fit to the to the local culture of uh, of uh, some some countries uh, in Africa, Asia, and these things, because uh, because the the design of this uh, tradition of this uh, modernist block of flats uh, is simply based uh, on European modernism, which was developed uh, in 20s, 30s, and now and after that it was uh, the the architects all over the world uh, somehow started to follow. These mechanisms, so so there is uh, some kind of conflict be 
in between the, the modernist uh, architecture, which is uh, built all, all over the world, and the and the local local uh, local uh, uh, local lifestyle of uh, of local people in different different uh, cultures, and also the this uh, social sustainability. It uh, in different in different cultures. It's uh, it also deals uh, a lot with uh, this uh, uh, with this uh, local lifestyle and uh, and uh, the, the 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 matter how these like social communities how they traditionally traditionally work. Yeah. So for me, it uh, there are some uh, overlappings, and uh, I made. Uh, I made uh, my research. Uh, one of my research I made uh, on uh, housing uh, development uh, in China. What's uh, really complicated, and I will not go to the to the details because uh, it's uh, the matter of uh, how Chinese economic work. It's matter of. Uh, Propaganda of Chinese Communist Party uh, and and it's really com complex, yeah. But uh, what I found interesting is that uh, that their traditional uh, traditional culture or traditional way how they built a settlement had some rules, yeah. The, the, there was some some rules of uh, how family work that, that they made the the courtyard houses, which was the the kind of inner world for the family and and the, there were some strict rules which were given by the traditional rules of the of their society and after that everything was changed into the into this like modernist book of flats and simply it it it, it doesn't reflect the the way how the society how the it, it doesn't reflect this uh, traditional roles of the society and uh, and when I made uh, this research, I found some uh, interesting theories. Uh, in the uh, 50s and 60s, uh, the Dutch architect uh, Aldo van Eyck, uh, he made some, uh, some interesting research. I will send you some, some article uh, about, about it. And... Uh, he read the book called Patterns of Culture, but by Ruth Benedict. Ruth Benedict uh, was an uh, uh, American uh, culture anthropologist, and uh, she somehow made a research on, uh, on languages uh, and the, some other culture, culture, like some traditional folk design and how the how some traditional cultures uh, act simply and she may I think she made the observation of American Indians some people in uh, Oceania and some other cultures I, I don't remember well yeah and after that she developed her uh, her, her theory that every culture has some uh, some rules and some systems and people of that culture somehow can adapt uh, to to that rules but they have problems with the with the things from the other culture because it's hardly adaptable for them and this uh, Dutch architect uh, Aldo van Eyck uh, he read that book and after that he made some study trips to to Africa he visited uh, he visited uh, Dogon villages in Mali and after that, he made some study trips to um, America to visit uh, the poor, traditional pueblos, pueblos of American Indians. And after that, he developed a theory that every culture has some kind of spatial syntax, spatial pattern, which the culture, which reflects the 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 this like uh, culture cultural identity let's say so so he started with the theory that uh, that uh, houses uh, in Netherlands should look uh, somehow and uh, houses in uh, in Africa should be absolutely different and should be somehow based on their their culture 
and uh, and <laughs> she spent the rest of his life simply by looking for the pattern of culture of 20th century and he didn't find it yeah <laughs> simply the, he spent a lot of time by by looking for what is the pattern of our current culture and after he developed that he, it's uh, absolutely super complicated and, and this thing and nobody follow this thing so now it yeah so so it's just a theory but i think it's a uh, it's uh, really interesting and it can be really useful for Tom and also also for uh, Massa because uh, Aldo van Eyck, he, he, uh, yeah, he really focused on the social sustainability as, uh, as the, the community, how these like, neighborhoods should look like and what is the neighborhood uh, in 20 20th century and what is the neighborhood of uh, modern society and and these things so i will i will send you these uh, these uh, articles and this is this can be really useful for you yeah i when i made my my research on housing in china i found these articles really really relevant for for these topics because uh, because the the problem of this, uh, like uh, uh, some, yeah, the, this problem of the conflict of uh, modernist architecture and uh, and local culture, it starts in twenties uh, and thirties because in uh, Le Corbusier's uh, book uh, towards new architecture, there is uh, there is simply written that. Uh, that the modernist architecture shouldn't be designed for uh, some uh, particular person, but it should be designed for typified human. He's using the term typified human, what means that uh, it's not a human, it's just a average of uh, uh, average of data on humans. So it's uh, Average of uh, of the toll of person and and everything uh, like this, but uh, this is not same all over the world. And uh, the modernist architects, they after uh, after this like uh, towards new architecture was published and the modernist architecture become really really like uh, the modernist movement starts and it was uh, it become to to be used all over the world. After that, they somehow come up with idea that uh, that this architecture should be the same all over the world, and uh, and that the these like local specifics and local culture doesn't exist. Yeah, but it's but it was uh, it's it's it was a mistake. It's it's not true. Yeah, they they just uh, doesn't. Uh, doesn't respect the lo local specifics and the lo local cultures. They just uh, they just use the the same design principles which were developed by European architects. They they use it in in uh, South America, in uh, in Brasilia. They use it in uh, in India. They use it everywhere. Yeah. So that was the mistake. And since that we can we can see this. Uh, this uh, conflict between uh, between uh, local culture and modernist architecture, and this uh, this conflict were highly criticized by Aldo van Eyck in the 50s and 60s. Yes, yeah, so so this can be this can be really really relevant for you. And I'm sending some. Let's check. Yeah, I'm sending some articles to to Tom, and I think this is also really relevant to Massa. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you. This is the first one. This is the second one. And for Tom, I also sending. Uh, yeah, this this is the the book uh, Patterns of Culture by by Ruth Benedict. I have read it, and for architects, it's uh, it's maybe sometimes too abstract, or it's uh, it's like uh, it's yeah, she's uh, culture anthropologist, but the Aldo van Eyck, 
he made his, his work is somehow translation of this book into architectural language, <laughs> I would say, yeah, or into architectural practice. So if you if you will study Aldo van Eyck's uh, some articles and theories from 50s, 60s, you will find uh, a, a lot of, uh, you'll find it more relevant for architects, architecture, yeah. And if I will go to the, to the, like uh, Nabila, if I translate it well, the, the furniture ergonomic. Yeah, I think uh, yeah, my uh, colleagues, uh, or oh, Jan, he said quite uh, quite a lot of interesting things uh, things for you, to you. And I have just maybe question or my idea if, uh, because you are studying the traditional furniture, and yeah, this traditional furniture was made by traditional craftsmen. They used traditional techniques. So everything was uh, made by by hand and they had these uh, they traditional materials in the in the case of Malaysia, probably it's uh, bamboo and wood. And uh, so so it uh, it was uh, a lot of these traditional designs uh, were just influenced by this yeah what what they these craftsmen were able to to make uh, with the usage of their tools and with the usage of their material and maybe if uh, if you made this uh, this research and uh, you somehow will think uh, how this research can uh, influence the the up to date production of furniture maybe you can also think uh, how to how we can we can use this uh, data which we which you will have from uh, from the research of traditional furniture and connect it with uh, our uh, our technologies we have in 21st century we have uh, cnc sprays we have 3d printing and these things and maybe you can you can somehow how how designed or somehow make some rules how to design a new typology of furniture, which will which will uh, use the basis of uh, of traditional furniture, but at the same time it will it will be based on the on on other tools we have the for the production of furniture now, if you understand to me. Yes. So this this will be for, for me for, for me quite interesting because uh, the this traditional furniture. These uh, these craftsmen in uh, in history they made this tradition of furniture and they were really limited. They were uh, limit, limited by their tools. Uh, they were limited by the material. They they simply didn't have the possibilities as we have now. So maybe how this traditional traditional furniture design can be somehow. If, if how we can use this knowledge of traditional furniture design within the framework of other other possibilities we have now because we have uh, we have uh, modern technologies and we have other materials we have uh, so so how 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 this can work together and how it can be developed into some typology of modern furniture for modern Taiwanese. Uh, not Taiwanese, Malaysian, uh, sorry, <laughs> for modern Malaysian, Malaysian uh, society, I would say. Okay. So uh, these are my comments. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, thank you very much for uh, 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 the comments. All right. Uh, we are at the end of uh, our program. So uh, we would like to uh to everyone to open uh, uh videos uh, so that we can capture uh, memories or mementos uh, for today's event so um uh let's open the camera so i can take the photos and yeah is everyone ready okay uh, you just take the photos one two three Okay, just hang on, another one more. Okay, one, just hang on, two, three. Okay, all right.
Thank you. All right, we are almost at the end. So uh, we would like to say thank you and uh, apologize for any technical issues. But before we uh, end of session, we'd like to uh, have uh, a few words uh, from uh, uh, Bruno's Universities for our closing uh, program for today. So uh, maybe um, uh, engineer architect, uh, Dr. Radik, you want to give any uh, closing uh, words for today's program? Yeah, maybe I, I thought if, if I can, uh, yes, I, yes. Uh, what came to my mind is, is uh, something a little bit more general because, because for me it was interesting that the, 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 uh, the uh, dissertation thesis from Malaysia were somehow in a way well structured and it was clear that um, the aim was to do like a serious scientific work in a way, this uh, this uh, uh, how do you call it? The in a way uh, in in a in a positivist way, like like the like the natural sciences are done, you know. So th there is certain like structure, a certain like data set, and trying to find like universal conclusions. Uh, and I think this is this is really uh, and and uh, this is a problem that we are that we are uh, all, also battling with here in in uh, in uh, Europe. How to do a research in architecture? Actually, if we should do it, you know, in the same way as the as the natural sciences do, uh, do like in this structural positivist way, that is uh, that is. Um, and I think we should do it at least at one part. But the second um, way is try to offer also the knowledge that we have as architects and skills that we have uh, as architects. And, uh, you know, because as architectural uh, students and professionals, we are, we are trained not to do a science, but we are trained to do a project. And this is completely different set of tools, you know, how to do a project. Of course, we do a research, you know, at the beginning and so on. But maybe we are more trained in like graphical stuff, maybe not that much in the writings and so on. And, and now the question is, if we should try to, when we are doing science, uh, you know, go in the way of traditional sciences of, or if there is a way to offer our knowledge, you know, uh, or our ways of doing stuff also for doing science because it then it becomes really problematic. This is what we call like research by design and so on. And nobody knows precisely what it is, but we are trying to do it. And I think we should try to do it because I think it, uh, if, if we, maybe we will fail, maybe, maybe the research by design and all these concepts are like, uh, you know, uh, destined to fail because uh, maybe they are not precise enough or structured enough and so on. But I think if we, uh, we if we don't try, then we are losing a very important way of uh, approaching world and and uh, and somehow posing important questions that are simply not possible in the framework of traditional science. And uh, and uh, and it's I don't know I, I don't have solution for this and I feel it as a as a really like big issue that has to be somehow you know on a philosophical way on on even like political structures because it is connected to financing of universities and so on but we somehow have to th think about it uh, yeah and uh, and. Yeah, this is this is what I somehow found find what I was thinking about when watching the the the, the dissertations from from uh, the from both faculties. Yeah, so I don't know. This is not a conclusion, but this is my final comment. Sorry for that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. I think uh, Jan, thank you so much for the comment and. Um, 
I think this is the, the good part of the collaboration because yesterday um, after we had this design uh, collaboration, we had a long discussion within our academic staff in the WhatsApp group <laughs> in terms of how UTM students approaching and teaching our students in terms of the pedagogy of the design studio. And today uh, when we discuss also about uh, doing a PhD research and the approach and the pedagogy, I think uh, both schools have different method in approaching yeah. uh, doing research. So th this is very fantastic uh, because different university maybe have different approaches. So this is actually an eye opener, not only for, for UTM and I think also for your academic uh, faculty members and staffs and students also. So I hope maybe we can carry on this tradition, Radek, <laughs> Ian and also Piri, maybe we can go to a one step further, not looking just into just a two collaboration that we have only for these two days. And maybe we can do this uh, perhaps uh, semester or yearly and things like that. So it's a good experience for, for us in UTM also. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. It was, it really made me think, you know, and this is the most important thing, I guess. That yeah. there is this, uh, there is this, uh, you know, by this, uh, maybe not confrontation, it, it is a, a wrong word, but by this, like putting things next to each other and seeing the differences, it, it really, it is really fruitful in terms of like self reflection, which is uh, super important. Yeah. yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful experience for these past two days with Bruno University. So we are actually glad and happy to have this collaboration. So thank you so much, uh, Radek, for the initiation <laughs> and also for the um, email that you sent to have this collaboration to me. All right, so I hope we can continue on after this. Okay, so um, any last words also from, from Radek and also from the team from Bruno? We have Christina and also Mary here. Yeah, I think... Uh... Almost everything was said, so I just want to say thank you to all people they joined this meeting, and uh, I hope we will we will see in the future again. Thank you very much. Okay, Dr. Sharia, I think that's that's all from <laughs> from yeah, okay. us. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Uh, is uh, any panels uh, from UTM want to say anything? But I, if it's not, we can close our uh, ceremony for today. And okay, I think we 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 I think we are at the end of uh, the programs, and uh, we would like to say thank you very much for joining us today. And we would like to say thank you too to our uh, panels expert panels from Bruno University and and. Uh, from University of Technology Malaysia as well. And we are very sorry uh, for any technical issues. However, we appreciate the passion and uh, patience and also we hope that we can see everyone next time and have a pleasant day. Thank you and Assalamualaikum. Thank you very much. Everyone. Okay, thank you so much, Ayan and Radek. Hope to see you guys again soon. Thank and you. Christina bye -bye. and Mary, have yeah, a nice bye -bye. day. Okay, so thank, you. Care. thank you. Thank you, bye-bye. Bye-bye.